Good evening and welcome to the Monday, February 11th meeting of the Cape Elizabeth Town Council. Could we please have the roll call from the clerk? Chairman Garvin? Here. Councilor Devereaux? Here. Councilor Gabrielson? Here. Councilor Caitlin Jordan? Here. Councilor Penelope Jordan? Here. Councilor Randall? And Councilor Straw? Here. Thank you, Councillor Randall emailed uh, just a bit ago, uh, unexpectedly detained by something at work, so not gonna be able to be here tonight. Um, we'll move on with the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag. We all please rise. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, do we have any reports from councilors, correspondence? Councilor Straw? Uh, I'll bundle this in with the, the finance report sure. if no one else has any other reports. Uh, so I was just going to highlight for everyone in case you didn't see um, in the news, the governor has uh, issued uh, her proposed uh, budget for the coming year. Um, I'd encourage everyone to take a look at it. Uh, reading the tea leaves and looking at it, the one aspect that I would note is that there's a component known as uh, local revenue sharing, uh, which the proposal is to set the rate of local revenue sharing at 2.5% instead of the 5% that was currently written in state law for the coming year. The effect of that on CAPE from my rough back of the envelope calculation is about a $600,000 decrease in uh, revenue from Augusta under that proposal. So again, nothing set in stone. We'll see how it plays out. These always change as we go. But from the revenue side, it's a $600,000 decrease from what we would otherwise have seen. Fortunately, we've already been down at 2%, so it's basically uh, going to be masked because we, it's money that was gonna be coming in that we're just not gonna get, so it will kind of be a wash from last year. But unfortunately, it is about 600,000 that would have been very helpful that may not be there. So, And with that, then turning, to, if no one has any questions on that, um, turning to the, uh, the budget report, so uh, my understanding is the town manager will have a little bit of an update on some uh, developments that have been going on on the budget side of things. Uh, you all have the dashboard which has highlighted various key revenue and key expenditures um, and uh, the various appropriation control documents. Uh, does anyone have any questions on any of those? Seeing none. Um, turn it back to the, the chair. Okay, thank you very much. Um, Move on. <laughs> My tab's not working here. Let me borrow the hard copy. Um, next up is citizen opportunity for discussion of items not on the agenda. Is there anybody here this evening that wishes to speak to something that's not on our agenda? Seeing none, we'll move on. Um, our first ad agenda item is a presentation from the Raise the Floor Coalition. If you wouldn't mind coming forward and introducing yourselves. And counselors should have a packet that they received at their desks here um, to follow along with. Good evening. Good. My name is Nancy Cronin. I am a selectman from Fayette, Maine. Good evening, I am Mark Robinson. I am the town manager for the town of Fayette. And thank you very much for giving us the, the opportunity to speak today. Behind you, you will see, or behind me, <laughs> you will see the history of the state subsidy for, for our school system in, in Fayette. And what you will see is somewhere around, oh, when the EPS formula came into, it, into existence, we lost a lot of money and we hit the, the cliff. Our town has about 1,200 people in it, and we are called a minimum receiver. But that doesn't really matter. What really matters is what we found an inequity in the way we fund our children's education. And what we've basically found is the formula, although some people love it, some people don't love it, but I'm gonna say it does a fairly reasonable job at saying how much a school should cost. But what it doesn't do is it doesn't do a particularly equitable job or good job at figuring out what a town can afford. So in essence, they created a 55% um, decision. They wanted to fund 55% of the EPS formula. 
I'll go back to the, to the, the state valuations town side. Let me just back up for five seconds. Pretend I didn't bring up the EPS again. Mm -hmm. Go back to the statement in which I said they don't do a particularly good job of figuring out how much a town can afford. And let me say one more thing. And that one more thing is the only thing they really have is how much your property values are. So they measure how much a town can afford pretty much based on property values. But is that how to measure how much a town can afford? It doesn't take in things like median income. It doesn't take thing in things like poverty level. Now the formula does look at reduced school lunches, but that's different. Um, and it doesn't take in other considerations. Okay. So when they created this EPS formula, they said what we want to do is we want to make sure that, the, that we pay 55% of the formula. Many people thought that that meant that every town should get 55% of their costs. That's not what it says. And frankly, they're doing a pretty good job. When I started looking at this, they were paying about 40%. Now they're at about 50% last year of, of paying the formula. And yet Fayette gets 4%, very little. What they did is they said, we're gonna pay 55% and we talked about 55%. Cool, but they never defined a floor. How little could you get with the formula? Wayne gets nothing. Belt grade, nothing, not a dime towards their school. Zero, zip, zilch. You get 7%. If I remember correctly, Falmouth? 24%. 24%. How many kids in Falmouth school? 29%. Oh, 29%. Yarmouth's 24. There's not that much difference between Cape Elizabeth, Yarmouth, and Falmouth. How did they figure that out? Is there a huge amount in, um, in the number of kids in this school? Uh, difference? Yeah, reported on the last year, 1,602, 1,600 and two and 1,602 versus? Uh, Yarmouth, 1,577. 1,570, that's not a lot. So it's not pupils. Okay, so what's the difference for these minimum receivers? How much money they get for special education costs? That was the bone that was given. That's a tough bone. I, my, my son has a special education. Special education. Um, I'm an advocate for kids with special disabilities as well in my profession. And I've sat in a lot of <coughs> town meetings in which I hear, would they only fund those kids? Do you know how hard it is to fight for inclusion when you're only one of those kids that gets funded? It's pretty hard. And is that right? I want my kid funded, no doubt about it. But that's a pass through from the feds. Why is the state not investing in every child? Shouldn't the state invest in every child? And I'm so tired sitting in town meetings and here only those kids get funded. I'm really over that. Okay, so as a selectman, I saw that. And I saw the folks with fixed income not being able to afford their taxes. And I saw a lot of inequities. And I pulled up the 279s. That's the funding formula. And I went to every single town in the entire state. And I pulled up what they made and what they got, how many kids they have. What, I went into census value and I said, how can I do this? And this is, I think, the first time, this is only the most recent version. I've now done it like three or four times. And I realized there was no way to tweak the formula that I could figure out that doesn't hurt somebody. But that floor, why can't we have a floor? So what we're proposing is that you either get the EPS formula as calculated or 15% of your total costs. It would cost about $25 million to the state when last year they put $126 million just because they could. We got, I think we got $3,000 more from that $126,000. 
it's a very small amount of money to raise when you look at the big scheme of things. Cape Elizabeth is a minimum receiver. You get under 15%. We're asking here to, for you to stand and support the raise the floor effort because we believe that every child deserves an investment no matter where you live in this state of a minimum of 15% of what it costs to educate them. That averages to about $1,800 per kid, $1,800 per child, no matter where they live. I'm not ask, we're not asking for, we are not asking for any more money. We're simply asking for a minimum. We want the 55% funded, but we also want a floor because my child should not be the bone. Kids with disabilities should not be the bone. Every kid matters. Every kid counts. And there should be equity that every kid should be invested so they live in our state and come back here. I told Mark that I would start off, I hope I wasn't all over the place, and then I would step aside. I'm good at numbers and I hope I'm okay at speeches. And there I go. Thank you, Nancy. Again, I'm Mark Robinson. I'm the town manager for the town of Fayette. Entering my 15th year as Fayette's manager. And as part of the celebration of my 15th year, my board of selectmen asked me to leave the office and tour the state of Maine. <laughs> this, this, this beautiful graphic you see before you has traveled as far south of the state and nearly as far north. I've yet to make it to Allagash, but it's been to the, to the western corners and, and the eastern corners. Uh, there are approximately 120 municipalities that benefit from the Raise the Floor initiative. And it's been our goal to reach out to all of those communities. If we can't meet them in person, which you know we attempted to do that, and we're still doing that as we are tonight, because I believe meeting face to face to explain what is a very complex issue is really the best way to communicate that issue. And to be very clear, the EPS formula, the Essential Programs and Services formula, is the method of distributing statewide education funding throughout the state. What we're advocating for is not changing that formula. We're advocating for establishing a minimum level of funding for those school districts and their municipalities that are characterized as minimal receivers. We're a minimal receiver, you're a minimal receiver. Vastly different communities. When you look at the EPS formula, every year the ED 279 report that's issued by the Department of Education will determine a total EPS allocation. And what we're advocating for is that if your subsidy falls below 15% of that number, then a new tier of funding be identified to bring it up to 15%. Right now you're at 7% bring it up to 15%. That's what we're advocating. And all minimal receivers will be treated with a fair hand by establishing a floor at 15%. We initiated this, this concept in a, in a group meeting in March, and subsequent to that, uh, we had meetings held in different parts of the state. Uh, Manager Sturgis had the opportunity to sit in on one of those meetings in Wells. And it was all part of the initiative to, to develop a coalition of communities to help advocate this concept and do it with the support of professional lobbyists. And I realize the word lobbyist sometimes can conjure up a negative response. But I, we've had success in engaging the firm Preddy Flaherty in the past. The town of Fayette led a similar coalition during the early years of the consolidation effort to avoid being penalized for not having met the consolidation requirements and sought out a delay of one year to avoid being penalized from not consolidating. That initiative saved over $8 million in subsidies for many school districts and their affected communities. And we're a very small group. I view this initiative to be wider reaching and of greater benefit. So we're, we're looking to you tonight not to sell you this idea. We're asking for your help. We are very similar. Of course, we're very different in ways, but in this, this respect, we are the same. 
And the issue of providing funding for minimal receivership districts very much needs to be addressed. We're not trying to compete with the initiatives that are before the legislature to reach the goal of 55%. We support that. But if today 55% were funded, Cape Elizabeth and Fayette receive nothing. We receive no benefit from that, from those laws being passed if 55% were met. And, and there's a lot of misunderstanding about that. There are some minimal receivers, very few, that would benefit from 55%, just to be clear, but the majority would not. One of the challenges we have when we go from town to town that hear this presentation, a number of the towns are, quote, the gold coastal towns. And we get the response of, why should we give more money to these rich communities? This is about fairness and equity. And as Nancy so eloquently stated, all kids matter. And they should be treated equitably. This is what we're about. And we're asking for your help. There's a very, I'm not a PowerPoint guy, but we put together a PowerPoint packet for you. And it's very detailed in explaining, uh, there's a number of questions and answers associated with, with this. It's a little dated now, but <coughs> our initiative was to, to start out to raise uh, $50,000 for lobbying services. We've raised $30,000. So selfishly, I need to put on my fundraiser cap and let you know that if this is something the Cape Elizabeth Town Council is, is supports and agrees to and would be willing to support in any way, we'd certainly welcome your, your financial participation in this effort. Uh, it's successfully moving forward. Legislation has been writ written. It has been sponsored by uh, Senator Mark Lawrence from York. And uh, at this point, we are in the final throes of having a, a co-sponsor, uh, multiple co-sponsors. And uh, it's moving in a, in a great direction. We're waiting for the LD number to be established, and we'll, we'll announce that in full force with uh, reaching out to various media outlets promoting this concept. We're a forgotten population of folk, and we need to raise the issue about raising the floor. Welcome. Any any questions, Nancy? Do you have? Can I say one more thing? Yeah, go ahead. Please. I don't have it on my, the last sheet here, but this proposal would help 26,000 children in Maine. There are 26,000 kids who are who are getting an investment less than 15% of the total allocation. So 26,000 children. Um, and this proposal for Fayette would mean about $180,000 increase. For you, it would mean an increase of about 1.2 million. 1.2 million. <laughs> that would be 1.2 million dollars more in your pocket. <coughs> Some towns don't care about the money. <laughs> but they don't. There's been some that don't want the money. But I would hope that they would want the space investment for their for every single child. So I just wanted to say that that, that is, you were talking about 26,000 kids here, and we're not just talking about Fayette or Cape Elizabeth, but we're talking about a statement that no matter how a budget is written in the future, however the EPS is tweaked, we will have a statement saying there has to be a bare minimum, and zero dollars per kid is not acceptable. Give us a minimum of 15%. Thanks. Thank you very much. Are there questions from councillors? Councillor Straw? Very shortly, because we have a long agenda. Um, thank you for the presentation. Um, hearing your pitch and the approach you're taking, I. Uh, I wish you the best of luck. Um, I had basically given up on changing the EPS formula. I do like the way that you're characterizing it instead as we're not touching the EPS formula, we're setting a fairness minimum. I think you'll have better traction with that. Um, and uh, I, when I see my local reps, I will mention it to them and urge them to support it, but as a private citizen. Thank you. Other questions or reactions? I'm curious what other communities are on board with you? Oh boy. Uh, Not all of them, but. Yeah, well, okay, uh, just, uh, we'll start from the southern end of the state. Obviously York, York I'm guessing. York, Wells, Agunquit. Uh, 
likely to move west. Uh, Greenwood, Woodstock, Newry, Bethel, uh, Andover, Cam Camden, Rockport, uh, Hancock, Lemoyne, Booth Bay, Booth Bay Harbor, Rangeley, Greenville, um, and their associated much smaller communities, part of their their school units, but that will give you, we're in the vicinity of 30? I think we're, yeah. Around 30, 30, 30 municipalities uh, that, you know, we've, we've been able to successfully become part of this coalition and contribute something. Moving further uh, down east, uh, Whiting, uh, Blue Hill, uh, Penobscot, Penobscot. It's kind of you know, it's a it's a link, it's a growing and lengthy list. But you know, we and far-reaching. It sounds like it is yep. far-reaching. We've done our best to try to to branch out and reach out. And again, coming down to you know, going to the place of Sedgwick. Uh, these I've seen a lot of Maine in the last <laughs> few months. So it's it's been quite an experience, and I've enjoyed it very much. But again, these are these are important issues, and it's a very complex matter. Uh, very complex, and uh, I know that uh, we'll all benefit from from this effort, no matter what the outcome. Uh, we know where we know what the competition is. There are a lot of competing factors. Revenue sharing. You know, we support going back to five percent. There's a finite amount of money that everyone's vying for, but to we can't dismiss this this inequity because it truly is an, an inequity. And uh, just, just anecdotally, a lifetime ago, I had the opportunity to do some contractual work uh, as a student at university. Spent a lot of time on Ram Island Farm, the Sprague Estate, Monk Estate, and got a chance to meet. I see some Jordans here. Got a chance to meet uh, Billy Jordan and spend some time with him. You know, it, was, it was a great experience. I don't know if there are any relatives here. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, but thank you for this opportunity. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Go ahead. I just want to echo Chris's words because I think this logically makes sense because that EPS formula has been frustrating to us for many, many years. And um, this, this seems to uh, have gone outside the box thinking, which I think is what we have needed to do for quite a while. And I appreciate all of the research you have done. That is just phenomenal. Uh, so thank you. Thank you very much. Sure. Go ahead. Um, I'd like to thank you also for all of this work and for coming here and giving this presentation. You said that you started this last March. Uh, so it sounds like you're pretty far in the process. Is there a, a timeline or a date that they're looking at for the bills uh, to be finalized? The, the legislation's been submitted. Uh, we're waiting for the assignment of an LD number that we can uh, give a, a, an all-out, full-force uh, uh, press release on and spread the word to, to get support for the LD number. We, we're just waiting for the number at this point. And what's, what type of participation are you asking for from each um, municipality? Support can be given in many ways. Uh, I, the, the, there's a resolution that I, that I shared with, with Manager Sturgis that uh, as a council you could consider uh, approving and signing that resolution, or it's in a word version, tweaking it to your liking so that you can you can support it and support the Raise the Floor initiative. Uh, there's your own personal advocacy, uh, working with your legislative representatives. Uh, Senator Millett is a key person and, and has given her position on the Education Committee. Uh, there are a number of ways, people in the audience, people that, that are willing to spend time to go to Augusta and provide testimony in support of the LD. That's meaningful. Write, a, write an email. Send a letter to, to your uh, state representatives. Uh, that is how things get done. And, and those letters and emails, you may not think are that important, but they are. They pay attention to that. That's important, you know, to hear from their constituency, to hear from uh, the concern and, and hear con support of, uh, of an initiative like this. Very helpful. And, of course, I'm going to put my <laughs> fundraiser cap on. You know, if you were so willing to help contribute to our, our campaign to uh, sustain and support uh, Dan Walker and uh, the, his colleagues at the firm of Pretty, 
Pretty Flaherty. Dan is a seasoned veteran lobbyist in Augusta, and I'm sure Senator, Senator Millett knows him well. Our original ask was $5 per kid. That would, that would be, be helped. But to be honest with you, it would go a very long way to making sure that Senator Millett knows this is important. That's a really, really big deal. Um, so a, a broad statement from you saying this is important would seriously move the cause. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank Any you. other comments or feedback? Appreciate your presentation and thank you for being here tonight. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Thanks for having us. Yeah. Now, I know you may not want me to part with this. All right, next up is a review of the draft, or no, I'm sorry, the town manager's monthly report. Matt, didn't mean to shortchange you there. That's right, Mr. Chairman. I uh, understand the length and the, the length of this evening's agenda. I'll be extremely brief. Uh, a couple of items that we have uh, to update on is that the budget season is currently uh, well underway. We're still assembling the capital plans uh, for, for the next uh, few years, but it's most specifically for this upcoming budget. And uh, departments are also in the final stages of bringing in their budgets and submitting them to me for assembly uh, for the upcoming 2019-20 uh, town budget. Another item that we have for an update is uh, last week, uh, the process for hiring the financial uh, uh, finance director, sorry, finance director for the town uh, is well underway and uh, we are working through that process. Uh, thank you to Councillor Straw. Uh, he did participate in the interviews and uh, uh, we're moving that forward and uh, optimistic to come back with a recommendation in the near, near future. So uh, with that being said, uh, we are also going to be closed on Monday in observance of uh, President's Day. So thank you, Mr. Chairman. Okay, thank you. Any questions for Matt? Seeing none. Uh, now we'll go to the review of the draft minutes of the January 14th regular meeting and January 23rd special <coughs> meeting. Is there a motion to approve the minutes as included in the packet? So moved. Councilor Straw, is there a second? Second. Councilor Jordan, any questions, comments, discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor? That's unanimous, thank you. Next item on the agenda is item number 39-2019, a citizen petition for the enactment of an ordinance to limit disposition of shoreline access and real estate. Uh, is there anybody from the public that wishes to come forward and speak on this item? Uh, please come to the podium, give us your name, your uh, address or affiliation, and uh, please try to limit your comments to about three minutes. Thank you. Uh, my name is Richard Nick Bryant. I live at 55 Spurwick Avenue, and I represent the Save Our Shoreline Access Coalition, and I was the principal drafter of the ordinance in front of you. The intent of our petition was to adopt a broadly applicable ordinance to reflect the wide public support there is for preserving shoreline access. We want to respect the citizen input of those council appointed committees that identify uh, shoreland access that should be protected. We want to respect the council's authority as our elected representatives to dispose of shoreland access rights when it's appropriate. And to that order, we want to impose some reasonably heightened standards on any such disposition, namely a strong consensus at the council level, the supermajority, or barring that public majority support at the polls. The charter gives the council a binary choice and a deadline of February 22nd to either set a date for a public referendum or to adopt the ordinance. Tonight, we're urging that the council adopt this ordinance. First off, there's clearly very broad public support from this as you can witness by the petition itself and also by the petition with some 1,400 plus signatures on a related but narrow issue regarding paper streets acceptance. Um, every town survey in living memory has shown the town's support for its natural resources and public access to those. And even the recent council elections have in part turned upon this issue. This form of the ordinance in front of you has been vetted and revised by the town attorney per the authority granted under the charter. So we know that the ordinance is not repetitive, illegal, or unconstitutional. We know that the ordinance is accurate in its text and its references. And we know that the ordinance is clear and precise in its phraseology. This ordinance is a thoughtful and responsible measure in light of the history of the council's actions in this matter. 
And I personally think that there's relatively little doubt because of that public support of the outcome of a public vote if it does go to referendum. Um, your agenda talks about you discussing next steps, which might include <laughs> setting a referendum vote or reviewing the ordinance for town council uh, possible action. But I think the council should keep in mind that discussing next steps or reviewing the ordinance, such as sending it to the ordinance committee, will not satisfy the charter. Your choice to be made by February 22nd is either to set a render referendum date or adopt the ordinance yourself. Now, if the council does set a referendum date, they certainly have the authority to take up any further action until that referendum vote is held. But I do not believe the charter allows the council to further change the wording of that referendum. And I don't believe the charter, the charter allows the council to avoid the referendum by adopting some other or different ordinance. So this suggests to me that any action other than adopting the ordinance, which I prefer you do to, that you do tonight, is really sort of beside the point, um, since there's no possibility of any further ordinance changes that would preclude holding that referendum. So in light of all that, I urge you to adopt the ordinance tonight as proposed. And I'm happy to answer any questions anyone has. Thank you very much. I'm Jim Mora, 5 Wombeck Road. There's overwhelming support for this ordinance change with over 800 valid signatures on the ordinance change petition. I have not seen any opposition to this ordinance change. There were no opposing voices in the January 23rd public hearing. Opposers, if there are any, were notified of this public hearing or tonight through town council agendas, three local papers and signs along Route 77. I have not heard of any letters to the town council opposing this ordinance change. This is not a controversial issue. Non-controversial ordinance changes do not need a public vote with its associated costs and delay. Follow the overwhelming support for this ordinance change by initiating the implementation of this ordinance change tonight. Thank you. Anybody else wish to speak on this? Okay, seeing none. Um, we do have a uh, town attorney here uh, from Monaghan Leahy. If anybody has any questions relative to the language in the ordinance, um, I'll reiterate what uh, Attorney Bryant just mentioned that <clears throat> we do basically have two, maybe three choices here before us tonight. One is to uh, adopt the ordinance as is presented here in the agenda, having had the public hearing on this last. Um, uh, at our special meeting, uh, there's no need to, as you would with sort of normal course of business uh, ordinances coming out of the ordinance committee, uh, have a subsequent hearing on that. We've already had the public hearing on this, so um, we can vote to adopt the ordinance tonight. Uh, we can not vote to adopt the ordinance tonight, but as uh, was mentioned, we do have a, a time-bound date by which we need to set up a public hearing, a public referendum rather. Um, so uh, that would be the second action to take. And then the third, as was also indicated, is that we can set that referendum date and continue to potentially take affirmative action on it prior to that, thus forgoing the need for the referendum, but having satisfied the requirement of the charter. Um, uh, as is outlined. So those are the three options before us. Uh, I'll be looking for a motion of some kind um, to advance discussion. Councilor Jordan. I would make a motion to adopt this uh, ordinance as presented. I think it's well thought out. And uh, so that would be my motion. There's a motion on the table. Is there a second? I'll second. Councilor Devereaux. Discussion. Councilor Jordan. I have a process question. Sure. I'm not opposed to the ordinance. I just, <clears throat> you, so you can't change it. You can't set, like, say we adopt it next year, you can't send it to ordinance and be changed. Say in 15 years you need to tweak it or you need to change something. What, what's the process for that? Like, would you have to then send the whole ordinance to referendum? Like, how does it work 50 years down the road, 20 years, whatever? Like, anybody? Matt, would you help and potentially That's attorney Hall? There's a reason for having Mike Hill here this evening. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't want you to go for nothing. Well, they want to just, justify his trip out. <laughs> uh, 
Michael Hill from uh, Monaghan Leahy. Yeah, it, as an ordinance, you would have the right to um, uh, tweak that at any time, really, after passage, um, next year, the year after, 15 years down the road. I know. Yeah. It, it, unlike a, a charter amendment, where it would have, then have to go out um, by vote of, of the townspeople, uh, an ordinance could be tweaked by the town council. Sounds good. Kastra. Uh, so I'm going to vote for this, but that's actually the process I was hoping to use, and hopefully you'll all are okay with that. I actually find that the ordinance is too permissive. Um, I would strike out basic, I'm going to vote for it because we can't alter it, but I would strike out everything involving the committees, and it would simply be, uh, and I also think we need a better definition of shoreland area, area, and I think we need a more explicit definition of what indirect access means. So I'm going to vote for it. What I would like to see, though, is that um, uh, take a step back. When I think about how you draft an ordinance, you want to dr draft it and you want to look at it in a vacuum as opposed to in the conflict and strife that is occurring in this particular instance. So when I look at how, how should the language be written, um, the way I'm approaching is imagine this is Kettle Cove and that the town has acquired Kettle Cove from the state. If I'm not on the town council, what restrictions do I want on the ability of the town council to dispose of Kettle Cove and just give it away? So if I look at it from that perspective, I don't want five town, I, want, I don't want 70% of the town council to just give away Kettle Cove. I want a stronger restriction. So what I would look at it is it must be sent to, um, to the public for a referendum unless it's uh, seven out of seven or six out of seven. So I'd like to see some revisions to it in the future. So it's good to hear that we can edit it. With that said, I'm gonna vote on it tonight. Other discussion? Um, I'm going to be in the minority on this, but uh, I did want to lay out my rationale for that. I don't disagree at all with the spirit of which has been brought forward with this ordinance. Um, I do have a very fundamental disagreement with the notion of elevating any particular um, issue or item uh, above anything else. I asked both the manager and the clerk uh, when I knew that this was coming to provide examples of other things that we have uh, more than a simple majority uh, vote in order to pass. And there's only two things. Uh, of all the things that we do, there's only two things. One is to enact an emergency ordinance and the other is to suspend the rules of the council. There's lots of other high priority things and high visibility things and things of great consequence and importance that come across uh, our agendas. And for none of those things do we require a supermajority. We can hire or fire the town manager with a simple majority. We vote on $40 million budgets with a simple majority. I see no reason why this should be any different. Furthermore, there's action that we've been uh, discussing and taking uh, relative to our 2019 goals. Uh, we've talked about including maybe a, the development of a coastal access plan. We've had two, almost two years now of work on the comprehensive plan update, which I know addresses this topic as well. Uh, and for the reason that Councilor Jordan uh, indicated as well, the fact that this could be changed tomorrow, save for the political blowback that any one of us would face if we went in a different direction than Councilor Straw was suggesting, I, I, I don't understand how this truly accomplishes the goal um, that is being sought here. I think uh, if, if we truly wanted to um, uh, codify this, then doing so through the charter uh, would have been a better way to go. That all being said, I'm clearly in the minority uh, on tonight's vote, and I have no doubt that this will probably pass at a referendum in June, if we schedule it for June. Um, as Mr. Bryant indicated, there's been strong community support for this. I, I think based on anticipated outcome of uh, uh, voters at the polls in June, it's in all likelihood that this would pass and, and then be enacted. So. Uh, that, that all being said, I disagree with it, and that's why I'll be voting no tonight. Councilor Straw. Uh, very much agree with a number of the statements you made there. I just did want to explain, because I also, what I was most bothered by was the supermajority. The way that I turned it around in my head, such that I'm like, okay, this sits better with me now, is to look at it like an expenditure of over a million dollars, which, <laughs> yes, it's in, the char it's in the charter as opposed to an ordinance, but if you instead look at this ordinance as 
any uh, disposition or whatever meets these various criteria has to go to the voters, but a supermajority can bypass going to the voters. So that's how I kind of turn, I don't, uh, it seems like I'm um, splitting hairs, but it's a way that I turned it around so I no longer viewed it as imposing a supermajority. Instead, it was a supermajority bypass the requirement that it go to the voters. So. Other discussion? Councilor Jordan? I was, that actually made really good sense. <laughs> Thanks. I was like, I'm stuck, I was stuck very much with where Jamie was. Like, why are we making this one special rule, you know, for this when, what, you know, yes, it's important, but but when you do your little spin around, it, you're, you're actually saving a whole lot of headache and, and money by not having to send it to a referendum. And you can change it tomorrow if we really need to. Well, next month. <laughs> yeah, I'm not going to meet tomorrow. Other discussion? Comments? Seeing none, I'll call the question. All those in favor of the motion on the floor? Opposed? Motion passes. The ordinance will take effect in 30 days. Next item on the agenda is item number 40-2019, uh, Thomas Mora Library donation. Is there anybody from the public that wishes to speak on this item? Seeing none, uh, I'll go ahead and introduce this. Um, brought forward to the Thomas Mora Library Committee um, recently, back in the fall, was an uh, offer to donate um, Two thousand dollars to the library uh, for a bench that will be placed outside of the library, uh, locating near the children's garden. There, um, the request was made by um, Bill and Joan Schmitz, who are former residents of Cape Elizabeth and both former volunteers in the community. Um, I was active with Bill on the recycling committee, and Joan uh, was a recycling center volunteer as well, among other things that they both did. And they have um, children and grandchildren who live here in Cape Elizabeth, and they're interested in. Um, memorializing that with this gift. So uh, I'm looking for a motion to uh, accept the donation and uh, with great gratitude. Second. Council Gabrielson, is there a second? second. Council Devereaux, any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor? Thank you very much. The next item is item number 41-2019, the consideration of funding to participate in the Pond Cove Elementary School Playground Project. Is there anybody from the public that wishes to come forward and speak on this? I know there are several. Thank you. <clears throat> Lauren Glennon, Three Garden Circle. In 2014, Cape Elizabeth School officials recognized that the 20-year-old Pond Cove School playground and 12-year-old outdoor classroom section of the playground were in disrepair, resulting in injuries and creating trouble with supervision. A 2015 community survey, including participation from the Greater Greening Coalition, CEIF, Cape Elizabeth staff, and students, resulted in a renovation design planned by Sashi Meisner. Sashi is a renowned local landscape architect who specializes in nature-based adventure play landscaping design specific to elementary school children. The build of this playground design was included in subsequent school budgets, but due to state funding cuts over the past three years, the playground build was continuously cut. Last year, the school board and town council approved fundraising efforts to get this built, recognizing its importance to elementary school children in their day. School officials then approached parents for help, after which a high energy committee of 30 parents and five teachers formed the nonprofit Pond Cove Playground Committee to fundraise for the build and ongoing maintenance of Pond Cove's playground. The playground design is still the same from 2015, which breaks the area into three major sections, providing important opportunities for imaginary play, nature exploration, and spontaneous group play. Natureland, one section, will offer an enhanced outdoor classroom and bird and butterfly garden. Little Adventureland, Little Adventureland is a new age-appropriate adventure play area for grades K through two, and Big Adventureland is an exciting adventure play area for grades three through four. 
The budget to build the design was 250,000 in 2015. We've increased that budget to 300,000 to accommodate increases in pricing since then and added a maintenance fund to ensure that the playground will be cared for and continue serving incoming classes in the community for years to come. To reach the budget goal of 300,000, the committee is engaged in a multi-pronged outreach strategy, considering contributions from all constituent levels of our community, as well as regional and national granting agencies. The committee has also undertaken the important role of communicating the need for this project to, con to constituents within and outside of the Pond Cove school community. Our campaign just kicked off on January 25th. I've provided the counselors with a snapshot of our projected income to highlight the types of organizations we are approaching. We've just gotten started. We will not receive everything that we applied for here, but at the same time, we didn't want to list um, and line item the names of local businesses or individuals with whom we've just begun conversations. We're buoyed by the responses that we're getting from our first round of conversations with local businesses and individuals and look forward to be able to fill out that last list with actual commitments and publicize it. Construction, construction will begin this year as soon as school is out in June, and we'll build what we have fundraised, either the full playground or by section. The hope is to build the whole project at one time to capitalize on the attention and momentum that we have now, rather than phasing out, out over years. And it will be the combined efforts from our town, school budget line, events, institutional support, and community individuals with which we'll reach the goal. So thank you to the town council for your interest and support of the project. One of the first questions we get with all funders is, will the town have a role in this and will the town support it? It will be the, to the benefit of our campaign and the project to be able to say yes. Playground committee members here with me tonight include school nurse Taylor, excuse me, school nurse Erin Taylor, Christina Just, and Jessica Morrell, and we'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Are there others that want to speak on this item? Okay. Um, does anybody have questions for the group? Uh, the question Go ahead. For, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, yep. Should I step down since? Uh, oh yes, I'm sorry. Thank you. Um, Councilor Devereaux had previously recused herself on this item, um, so yeah, thank you very much. I neglected to mention that. Um, I'll just point out a point of process here. Um, while we still maintain quorum, even with Councilor Devereaux's recusal, uh, I just want to remind councilors that a four vote, um, we do need four votes to pass, it's not a majority of the quorum, it's still four votes in order to take any action on anything, so I uh, just want to point that out. Um, are there questions that anybody has for the um, organization? Um, I want to thank you for your comments and presentation and the materials that you've provided. Um, by way of background, um, we discussed this at workshop uh, last month. Uh, it was a consensus of the council to um, consider the recommendation of a $50,000 uh, contribution, which would be made from the unassigned fund balance uh, with the potential of adding an additional $50,000 matching grant. Um, uh, Manager Sturgis and I, and I know in separate conversations, the manager has spoken with representative of the organization, have talked about the fact that that would be um, within the remainder of the fiscal year, uh, the potential matching grant. So because these are um, dollars coming out of the current unassigned fund balance, um, really the only stipulation um, with the matching grant would be uh, the time constraint of, of ha having it be matched within the remainder of the fiscal year. Um, I will point out also that um, having just gone through the review of our audit, uh, you're all aware of the fact that the unassigned fund balance is in very good health. Um, and um, so the, the dollars are there to, to do this if we so choose. So uh, with that being said, I'll look for a motion uh, to advance the discussion. Um, I, so I guess the, the motion Consistent with uh, what's in the report would be that we would appropriate fifty thousand uh, dollars toward the project as an initial grant, with up to fifty thousand dollars in matching funds to be expended before the end of the fiscal year. Yes. Okay. I'll is, make that motion. Is there a second? Second. Councilor Jordan, any discussion? I'd None? just like to commend yep. the committee for taking the effort to organize themselves and take on this project. It's no small undertaking. Thank you. Any other discussion? 
I'm really happy to support this, as you can probably tell. Um, I also think that um, if we think forwardly towards the budget season upcoming that Matt just mentioned, um, using money from the unassigned fund balance that we have now is money that we don't need to allocate in the upcoming fiscal 20 budget. So there is the, the, the forward looking benefit to that too. Um, so I'm very, very happy to uh, vote in favor of this tonight. Any other discussion or questions? Seeing none, all those in favor. It's unanimous, thank you very much. Thank you for being here. Next item is number 42-2019, receipt of the comprehensive plan. We have both the chair of the comprehensive plan committee and the town planner here. Uh, before I invite them up, is there anybody from the public that wishes to speak on this item? <coughs> Seeing none, Mr. Thompson and Ms. O'Meara, would you guys come forward? Hi, I'm Tim Thompson. I'm the, was the chair of the Comprehensive Plan Committee. I live at Six Pine Ridge Road. I've been a, a resident in town for uh, over 32 years. I probably would have got up and spoke in favor of the, the playground, by the way. Uh, I'm, I'm, it's a warning to all my friends, parents and grandparents that already have children that are through the, through the school system and maybe are not still suffering from maltuition, that uh, they're probably going to get a call from me to, to support that. But... Uh, I know there's businesses in town and, and certainly uh, uh, parents and, and uh, grandparents that are very supportive of their, uh, their, broad, their playground. So just wanted to say that. But uh, thank you for a few minutes tonight. I know you've already got your draft copy of the comprehensive plan. And uh, I want to I tell you how much I have enjoyed uh, this, this two years. Uh, it goes way back. Uh, we, we were actually appointed to this committee in 2016. Uh, it was a terrific committee. We had unbelievable participation. Hardly anybody missed any meetings. Uh, and for, I, I know you know a lot of the people on the committee, but for the people that are watching, maybe for home, I'd like to just take a minute and, and mention the people that were on the committee. Uh, and what their backgrounds. Peter Curry was uh, one of the citizen representatives. Peter's been in town for a long time. He's got a terrific background. He's a lawyer and, and was just amazing. Uh, what he contributed, all, all the time and experience he has on the planning board was, was just invaluable. Uh, Elizabeth Goodspeed, uh, also uh, Eliz uh, representing the citizen uh, uh, member, uh, started on the committee uh, as a member of the Cape Elizabeth Land Trust. By the time we were done, she was the head of the, she's the president of the Cape Elizabeth Land Trust. Uh, representing the town, we had uh, rep uh, Councillor Penny Jordan, um, not only representing your town council, but very, very ably representing the farm interests, the fishermen's interests, did a terrific job and, and with all the background that she was able to bring to it. Um, we also had uh, the other town council representative was Sarah Lennon, and Sarah represented uh, many of the interests of, of uh, the town uh, with all the experience she had as a town councilor. She, was, she, she brought an amazing expertise. Uh, we, we ended up getting Kevin Guimond, who came on the, the, the committee a little bit late. We had one uh, a member that had to drop out doing, during, during, doing to, uh, because of some work uh, conflicts. But Kevin Guimond came on later, was appointed by the, the appointments committee, and he represented a ter terrific background in uh, municipality. Uh, he was a longtime fire chief in South Portland. Is born and raised in Cape Elizabeth, so he, he brought some uh, real valuable uh, uh, contributions to our committee. Uh, Harvey Rosenfeld, also a citizen representative, uh, long time uh, worked at, in Scarborough in economic development, so he brought some expertise that was really valuable. And then last but not least, Victoria Valent, uh, representing the planning board. Uh, I mean, she, she's, uh, she's got an, a master's in land use planning, works at, in Portland in Yandle, land use planning. So the expertise on this uh, made it a little bit of a challenge for me to be the chairman of this group because I was probably the least qualified to be on that committee. But it was a fun uh, experience. Everybody uh, worked well together. We, I can't think of a single issue that we, we went through that we, we had uh, 
I mean, uh, conflict that we couldn't get through. When we ran into a difficult uh, topic or something that we were struggling with, I would I, I started using a, a tool, and the tool was we'd we'd take a boat. If we if we were try having trouble getting through something, we'd vote, and however that vote went, we would deal with the issue and we'd move on. So that 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 seemed to work out pretty well for me. Um, so I'd like to thank uh, uh, all of those members because they they did put in a lot of time and effort on putting this draft together for you. Um, what I also primarily wanted to do tonight was to thank the, the town staff that were part of this. Uh, Maureen O'Mara and, and her folks upstairs uh, were just amazing. Every, every meeting we had, within a, a few weeks, we would have minutes, we would have everything completely done, we'd have rough drafts of chapters, and then just as we went through, the book just got built chapter by chapter. Uh, I know you all know it, and I know most of the people in this town know it, but Maureen O'Mara is pretty amazing. Uh, our our uh, minutes keeper, I think she does a lot of minutes for the town, but I'd also take, take a minute to thank uh, Hiromi Dolliver. Um, how she got the minutes put together was kind of amazing because we'd be talking and talking and talking and I'm like, how the heck is she going to get all this down? But she always did and she was always amazingly accurate with our minutes. Uh, so I'd love to take a minute and thank her. Um, the town provided us with a budget for this to actually get out and hire some, uh, some folks, some professionals. Uh, one, of the, one of the goals we had was to make sure we got a lot, we did, made a ma major effort to get involvement from the, from the town, from the community. Um, and so we, we actually hired uh, uh, professionals to help us with that, hired, prof hired professionals to help us with putting out a survey. And uh, Judy Colby George from Spatial Alternatives was just so helpful. Uh, kind of knew what we want. Obviously, she's done a lot of work for the town in the past. She and Maureen have a, a very good working relationship, very good professional working relationship, and, and uh, they always managed to, to put together what we needed. Uh, we, we decided as a group, we wanted to have, as I said, we wanted to have a lot of input. We started with the Strawberry Festival way back in the, in the summer, our first summer together. That got, got us going. We had open, we had three open forums. Uh, Maureen and I went to Ted, uh, Ted Jordan's uh, AP government class at Cape High School and in, invited those uh, high school kids to come. They did, this place was packed. Most, uh, all three of our forums took place here uh, and they were very well attended. And we, we had a lot of fun. The, the kids brought a lot of extra energy to the whole process. Um, and I, I think they gave us some really good in, input. And it was, I think, a good experience for them to participate in town government. Uh, Ted Jordan does a great job in, in, that, in doing that. Uh, the, the, the last, and we got input. We, we interviewed every single one of our town's department heads took time, came to our meeting seven o'clock at night. So, you know, after their work day was done, they came and talked to us. Town manager uh, came and talked to us. Fire chief came and talked to us. The process went on so long, we had identified one of the challenges you all have is we've got department heads that are gonna be retiring. Well, the process took so long, one of our department heads actually did retire. So, the, the, and the police chief uh, was, was terrific. Uh, we had input from, we had regular people that came to our meetings every month. Uh, we had input, uh, people would come per, for particular chapters. Uh, I personally, one of the, one of the, uh, the things as a chair was uh, kind of a challenge for me is we made the mistake or, or I guess the reality of mentioning connectivity uh, in one of our meetings. Uh, after talking to the fire chief and hearing from the, the public works department, the connectivity in town was a good thing. And uh, uh, I never thought too much about it, but, at our, and, but it was in our minutes and it was on the website. And at the next meeting we had, I think 30 townspeople to, that showed up at our meeting to, to let us know that connectivity was ne not necessarily a, a great thing. Uh, but it's one you'll, challenge, you'll be challenged with, and, and uh, one of the, it, it was an eye opener for me. And, and I think when it comes to figuring out how to uh, deal with connectivity in our town, there's probably some technology out there. I think Penny would agree that that we can probably deal with some of that connectivity. But getting the department heads to participate in that was just 
uh, it's just it's just terrific to un understand how much our staff, how much our employees, uh, you you obviously are great evidence of it as well. Um, how how uh, important it is that this town continues in in the direction that it's been um, going for decades. One of the things we regularly heard from people as we went out, and we went out into eight, we, we did 18 meetings amongst the community. I never knew how many neighborhood associations there were in this town. There's a lot of neighborhood associations. We went out and talked to them all. We went to Perputic and we had a meeting, we, we had an evening at Perputic and we got a lot of great feedback. And one of the things we regularly heard was the town's been well run. Uh, to, and in fact, one of the things I regularly heard as the chair of the committee is Thompson, don't screw this thing up. You know, <laughs> that uh, it's well run. Uh, we continue to, we've had a, we had a great town manager for uh, several decades. We got a great, great new one. Uh, and people, people get together and coordinate, you know, they work together in, in the best interest of the town. I know one of the things that this is, we're, as a committee, this is a draft, okay? We've done the work you've asked us to do. This isn't certainly the pro final product. Uh, I know you've scheduled workshops in May and I'd be happy to participate in those and I know some of our town members would be happy if so, if you, if you so choose. Uh, but now the work goes to you. Uh, this isn't a final document. It's, it's something that you, you'll need to continue to work on and, uh, and tweak and, and, uh, and uh, you know, Find new things that you need to to, to uh, explore a little further, but uh, I know about I know about our alawives now in this town and some of the challenges the alawives have. I know we have we have this beautiful pond over here. We got to keep pure and clean. And uh, one of the things I would like to to mention is uh, the harbor committee in this town that you also put together uh, did a remarkable amount of work. Uh, in fact, Nate Perry uh, is in the audience tonight. Uh, Nate and that, that committee and the, the fishermen in this town put in a ton of work. They, they practically wrote that chapter for us and I'd like to rec uh, recognize them and working closely with Maureen to, to make sure that that all got done as well. So, uh, but primarily want to thank the committee, uh, thank our staff and thank you for putting this together and, and I think you'll find uh, this document will help you uh, uh, put together what we need to do for the next 10 years. So, thank you. Tim, thank you very much. And, um, you know, I'll first say on behalf of not only the council, but frankly, really on behalf of the entire community and all the citizens in town, thank you for all the work that you and all of the, com the committee members that you listed, uh, all of the staff. Um, this is a tremendous amount of work. And uh, for those that are here and those watching at home and things like that, um, this is, you know, a, an extremely important thing that we undertake. Um, and like I said, it's a tremendous amount of work that you all took on. Um, and you're all volunteers. Um, and, you know, we're very, very grateful for all the countless hours that you put in and really the quality of the work that you've produced. So, again, uh, on behalf of the council, on behalf of the town, thank you very much for all that work. And we look forward to working with you uh, as we go through the process that you mentioned, the workshops that we'll have upcoming, um, and ultimately towards... Uh, you know, approval of the final product. But um, I was, I was kind of happy when I was chairman before and we were organizing the comprehensive plan committee because we had said that the chairman shouldn't be on the committee. <laughs> so it meant that I got to get out of jail free card <laughs> at the time. Um, Councilor Jordan, former Councilor Lennon, uh, everybody else that you mentioned, um, really appreciate all the hard work and time and extra commitment that you all put in. Um, Councilor Lennon, I know it was, you know, technically beyond her, her term in office too. So um, uh, special thanks to her. So um, really an, an incredible amount of gratitude that I have personally and, and, and the community has as a whole. So thank you. One, one more thing. Yeah. As I was going down through my list, one person I missed, Susanna Measle Hubs. Yeah. Mm -hmm. She's a school board chair. And she found time in amongst budgets and all the other stuff. She was able to provide the, the school board's input and did her, and she was at every one of our meetings and was just phenomenal. And it gave me the opportunity to get to know her better. Um, and uh, and I, I wouldn't want to miss her, but uh, thank you for it. It was a pleasure. Thank you. thank you very much. Any questions for Tim before we let you go, Tim? Any questions now? No? Okay. It's just a draft. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so included uh, with the uh, agenda items here related to this item is a link, uh, and uh, you all have in front of you the schedule uh, that we've discussed in workshop. 
Um, so I'll just uh, go through it quickly for, again, those here in the audience and at home. Um, we're going to pick up in May on the other side of budget season our review uh, and discussion of the various chapters um, that make up the comprehensive plan. So uh, Wednesday, May 8th, um, we'll have a workshop, uh, a lengthy workshop for about three hours. We'll go through a number of different chapters uh, of the plan including, uh, and these are all open to the public and the public's encouraged to attend and, and, uh, and, and offer their input as well. But um, the, the chapters that we'll cover at the Wednesday, May 8th um, meeting are reviewing the public participation summary, population and demographics, economy, transportation, housing, public facilities and services, fiscal capacity, capital investment plan, natural resources, agricultural and forest resources, marine resources, water resources, and historical and archeological resources. Um, we will then, at our May 13th meeting, schedule a public hearing uh, for June 10th. So we'll have a, a specific public hearing on this item. Uh, further workshops on the 15th uh, will review remaining chapters uh, covering land use for existing land use, recreation and open space, future land use plan, regional coordination plan, implementation and evaluation of recommendations, uh, the various appendices and vision statement and executive summary. We'll go through all that, um, have another workshop on the 22nd where we will discuss uh, the entire plan and finalize any revisions. Um, the material will go up on the website prior to that public hearing that I mentioned. And then we will um, consider a vote of adoption on July 8th. Uh, so that's the schedule that we've outlined. Uh, so with all that being said, uh, we have a recommended motion in the agenda here. Is there anybody that would like to make said motion? Council Jordan is a representative of the committee. I will attempt to make this motion. Um, I'd like uh, Kip Elizabeth Town Council to acknowledge the receipt of the draft comprehensive plan 2019 as recommended by a 9-0 vote by the Comprehensive Plan Committee. Um, and um, I would like to thank them for their work. So it's accepting the uh, comprehensive plan by the council is my motion. Thank you, is there a second? second. Councilor Straw? Is there any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor? It's unanimous, thank you very much. Thank you again. Next item on the agenda is number 43-2019, Fort Williams Park 2019 group use requests. Is there anybody from the public that wishes to speak on this item? Seeing none. Uh, we have one, two, three, four different uh, group use requests here. They were uh, voted by a six to zero um, unanimous vote of the Fort Williams Park Committee to recommend these requests. Is there a motion? I'll make the motion. Council uh, Gaberson. That the council approves the recommendations of the Fort Williams Park Committee to approve the following 2019 group use requests at Fort William Park as presented. Do we need to read them? Or? Is there a second? Second that. Council Jordan, any discussion? Oh, uh, Council Straw? Um, did we ever get a, a fee uh, schedule for Beach to Beacon for this year? Uh, the fee schedule from the prior year says it's up to and including 2018. It doesn't say anything about 2019, if I recall correctly. I could be wrong, but that was my recollection from when I was back on the Park Commission. Is up through this coming race and then we renegotiate starting for 2020. Yeah. So Pulling up the one I see on the website, I see an asterisk effective through parentheses and including the 2018 race event with the annual use fee of 25,000. 
so, manager's uh, looking as well right now. Yeah, I don't know if that affects yeah. this vote or not. Yeah, yeah, Only if you it, want it, to charge it, more. If I may, Mr. Chair, it, it was my understanding that it was through this year as well, so that's, that's why we didn't uh, address that. Uh, it may be the opportunity now to inform them that we will want to negotiate for next year. Uh, but at this point, I think we may be. So uh, the approval for tonight is going to be applying last year's fee. In it would be, right. okay. to, to so, be technically oh, correct, yes, so, sir. But we have a fee. Obviously, we'll be able to apply that fee. Yeah. Yep. All right. Just to clarify, the fees that we charge separate from the approval of the group use request, or, or the, is it? They've been, they've been agreed to over, over the years uh, with, the, with the race. No, 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 I'm, I'm not even speaking to oh, the race. Sorry. Like, there's other, there's other group use fees that we approve. Is that, are they always tied together, the, the use request and the fee, is what I'm saying? I, I think so, so. yeah, yes, okay. I think so. Yeah. It, it, that totally hear what you're saying. Yeah, yeah, so I was just thinking, uh, I don't want to approve something if we're approving something where then there's no fee attached to it, because all I was dotting I's crossing T's. But if we're all on the same page that the understanding is the fee from prior year is still applied, I'm, I'm fine with it. Right. Any other discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor of approving the use requests? It's unanimous. Next up is uh, number 44-2019, review of the funding for the construction for pedestrian and parking lot improvements within Fort Williams. Is there anybody in the public that wishes to speak to this? Seeing none, this is a follow on to our uh, previous review of the proposal um, from Mitchell and Associates last month. Um, the manager has some funding options for us to review. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yes, uh, this past week the the project went out to bid uh, to the public. We're looking to have uh, and receive those results of that request for proposals uh, shortly. Uh, but in the interim, and before we do get uh, a final number back from a uh, winning bid number from uh, hopefully m multiple participants, uh, we, I did have the opportunity to review what we have at the Fort, Fort Williams Park Fund as well as at the Portland Headlight Fund. Uh, Looking at the two balances, our current fund balance on the Fort Williams Park Fund is $459,000 roughly, and then on the Portland Headlight Fund, it's roughly $869,800. Say the second again, please. Uh, $869,800. Okay. I, I am rounding yep. very slightly, but uh, my recommendation at this point would be, as, as was discussed at the council level, was to do 75% from the Headlight Fund of the project cost and 25% from the uh, from the Fort Williams Park Fund. I think the estimated amount that we're looking for the total project cost is in the $400,000 range, uh, so it would be roughly 300 and 100 breakdown. Uh, I will have uh, sharper numbers when we come back with the, with the finalized uh, budget amount, but at this point in time, that would seem like the most responsible way to go about funding the, funding the project. Okay. Um, so are you looking for us to authorize that as part of the action here? I think more or less uh, at this point I'd like to just inform you as to how okay. the direction as to where the funds would be coming from and then ultimately we'll have a firm number uh, instead of giving you more of a conceptual amount but I just want to wait till the update. bids come in. Yeah, when yep. we finally get the finalized bids which I anticipate we'll have for action on, on the March, uh, March 11th agenda. Uh, so we should be in good shape for that and have a, a firm number at that point in time. But I wanted to, you to know as the, as the full council that there was, you know, there'll be a subsequent act, but, uh, but we do have the funds to get us through to that point. Okay. Are there any questions for Matt on this? Okay. Thank you for the information and the Thank detail. You. I agree um, with the direction that you're signaling in terms of splitting the expenditure. Um, and I think that based on the, how we forecast revenues from the headlight fund, that that will repl replenish pretty quickly. So um, any other questions from anybody else? No? The, the one other item, if, if I may, Mr. Yep. Chairman. Uh, some may ask why or how the uh, headlight 
have uh, accumulated a certain amount of revenues. The funds that are generated by the by the gift shop at the headlight are specifically to be used in support of the headlight, but this falls within the within the realm of an allowable expense because this is the I mean, it's all part of the fort, but this is the fort parking area that directly benefits that area. So it's it's that great level of greatest impact, I think. So it it, it definitely passes the ability for to, to use those funds for this purpose. I agree. Uh, okay, seeing no other comments, we'll move on to item number 45-2019, the commercial bus fees at Fort Williams. Is there anybody from the public that wishes to speak on this item? Please come forward. If you could give us your name and either address or affiliation and limit your comments to about three minutes, please. Hi, my name is Chris Rackmeyer, and I'm here representing the Main Tour Connection. We're a receptive tour operator located in South Portland, um, 96 Ocean Street. And I would like to uh, request that the Town Council reconsider and uh, look at the fees that are being implemented for the Portland Headlight um, motor coach fees. Um, the impact that it has on us directly, we have gone from a uh, $50 fee to triple to $150 per coach that goes through. And when we contract out our coaches and our packages that we do, we actually book out anywhere from um, the, the leeway time is about 18 months. So at this point, we've already booked on 2019. So for us, we've got about 200 to, well, 230 to 250 coaches that would be coming through that will directly impact us personally as the company um, at a loss of anywhere from $17,000 to $18,000. Um, what happens at that point is we can't go back to the companies that we've contracted. So we're looking for you to reconsider that triple jump that happened. Um, we had planned in about a $75 increase, knowing that there was going to be a fee that would be implemented. Um, that impact also includes some of our community and our tourism community, everywhere from gas stations to staffing to um, local businesses that support motor coach and tourism. Um, with that being said, I'd like to see if it could be considered changed or back to at least the $75. Uh, we do have what will impact us is in the future, we have motor coaches that will ask us to change those packages because of the fees. They might go to a different state where our community is going to lose in Portland for sure. Um, they might change to go to Neville Lighthouse or Pemaquid. That's a $75 fee. Um, so that's where I'm coming from. And if you have questions on you know, what we do as a company, I'd be happy to answer those as well. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Uh, other comments? Um, hi, my name is Shannon O'Mara. I live at 18 Ivy Road with my husband, Jerry Canneller. Um, he's talked on this topic before, but he has a cold, so he volunteered me. <laughs> so I'm going to read his notes. Um, he said, I, re I reviewed the proposed free fee structures, and I have two items to raise. One, I, don't believe the fee I believe that the fees are too low and should be reconsidered, and I don't believe that the fees are adequate for the risks that we bear as a town. The latest proposal projects approximately 162,000 in revenue from commercial fees for 2019. We aren't sure about the exact number of commercial visitors, so we assumed 160,000 visitors to the park from commercial sources, which comes out to approximately a dollar of revenue per visitor. And if that number is actually higher, then we would be getting less than a dollar per visitor. When the Fort Williams Park Committee is asked about the criteria that they consider for setting commercial fees, we heard three main points from them. One is a desire to keep the park accessible to as many visitors as possible, make it affordable for the visitor, and be mindful of the cost to commercial businesses when they set their prices for the year. Those are very kind, generous, and empathetic arguments for the visitors and the commercial businesses. 
The issue that we have is that there is another stakeholder that is not being considered, and that is the Cape taxpayer. When it comes to increasing property taxes for residents, I have never heard that level of empathy and kindness toward the taxpayer. So we ask that the Town Council go back to the Fort Williams Park Committee and request a revenue per visitor higher, $5 per head, and set your pricing based on how many visitors each commercial carrier is bringing to the park. For example, a trolley company charges $29 for an adult visitor and Norwegian Cruise Lines charges $59 for a lighthouse tour. We believe that adding $5 to their pricing will not disrupt their business, sorry, nor will it have any negative impact on the visitor's experience. However, the additional $5 in revenue will have a substantial positive impact on the town. Another example, I noticed that you're charging $3,000 for a seasonal pass for the trolley companies. At $29 per adult, they cover that $3,000 cost after approximately 103 adult trolley customers. At an average of 10 people per trolley, per visit, and an average of four visits per day per trolley. The trolley company will earn enough revenue in less than one week to cover their entire six month season. Any further revenues after that first week are gonna to go to the trolley company. Um, lastly, I'm asking counselors Gabrielson and Devereaux, you campaigned on this topic to optimize the commercial fees generated at Fort Williams Park. We ask that you take ownership of this and request a commercial fee structure that is more in line with the taxpayer's concerns. And I had a few of my own comments to, to add. That, that was Jerry's. Um, when was the last time that you went on vacation? You went to a city and you went to like the premier landmark in that town. Did you walk away because it cost $3 or $5 more? You didn't. You went. You're on vacation. You want to see these things. And, and a, an increase, you know, a 20% increase is not, I feel egregious. And then my second observation was tonight's agenda items included additional funds for parking at Fort Williams, potential parking management related to pay and display, funds needed for a new playground, town center sidewalks um, or work on those, and legal fees for shoreline access, which has been going on. Imagine that so Fort Williams is self-funded. Self-funded. If they raise these, these premiums like this, it could be self-funded. And then the, the they can be self-funded and then the budget that the town gives to Fort Williams can go for some of these other issues. That's it, thank you. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Anybody else wish to speak on this item? Seeing none. Um, okay, so back in November, uh, we approved the commercial vehicle fees um, and this item is before us, as we've heard from, like we have tonight, several, uh, specifically several tour operators um, uh, who have come to us and expressed concern um, about uh, not just the amount of increase, uh, specifically relative to the motor coaches, um, but the lack of uh, sort of ramp time to that increase. So that's why this item is back before us. So. Um, is there anybody that wishes to make a motion to advance discussion? For the purpose of discussion, I'll make the motion that we uh, revert to the recommended $75 per bus um, proposal that was made by the Fort Williams Park Committee, which also I think had a um, gross volume discount of $70 per bus once achieved at a certain level. Is there a second? Second. Councilor Jordan, discussion. Councilor Devereaux. Uh, when we talked, first of all, this was passed um, before um, Mr. Gabrielson and I were elected. I have issue with a lot of the fees. I think they're way too low, which we've discussed um, previously. When we think about the burden on our taxpayers and what this is costing the town, not only in um, cost of repair and maintenance of our roads, repair and maintenance, look at, we're talking about changing our parking lot, 
at Fort Williams. There's a lot we have to do. Um, we've had people in our community talk about not being able to park because they're, there's nowhere to park because there's so many buses and tourists that they can't even park to watch their kids' soccer games. There's something wrong with that picture there. Uh, at our last town council meeting, we had um, a person tell us that one bus company is already bringing in 866 buses. That's one company, and um, uh, which we were saying we got 700 buses in one year. This is one company bringing in 866, knowing that we're charging $150. Uh, I understand that they've already made contracts and uh, thought that it might be $70, but we didn't say it was $70. There was nowhere that anyone said it was $70. It was a, a recommendation. Nobody came and talked to us about it. Um, I have some difficulty in, um, in changing the fees. I agree with possibly a graduated schedule so that um, tour bus operators can figure the cost in. But I really think 75 to $100 is more than reasonable and it should be $5 per person. At Bar Harbor, they're charging $15 per person. And um, I, I, I see that as fair, $5 per person. I believe that our trolleys aren't, char aren't charged, to, we're not charged enough for trolleys either, but yet we want to charge um, residents of Maine to park. So I'd rather we didn't charge residents of Maine to park and up the cost on the motor coaches, the vans, and the minibuses. I'm, um, I know that uh, the discussion is to um, look at a graduated scale of, of fees. I haven't seen that graduated scale. I'd like to know what that looks like. And, um, and also I'd like to know if uh, this charge is for the year or if it's just during the season. Because buses come and go all year long they should be charged the same amount all year. The bus still weighs the same amount, brings the same amount of people, does the same amount of um, same amount of people use the porta potties and use the roads. So I don't think there should be a discount for off seasons, which I don't know that we've discussed that either. Uh, so right now I'm I'm on the fence about agreeing to this because I feel like it is a huge burden on our taxpayers, and if we do agree to change it, I would say, just for a few months, and then it goes, it goes back up to the 150 and continues to increase. Uh, come to you in a second, Councilor Stratt. Um, Jim Carney from the Fort Williams Park Committee. Would you mind coming forward while we'll waiting? Um, the, uh, what's on the floor at the moment would be just for setting the 2019 fee, of which we've already done previously, and it would be potentially revising that. Um, I'll ask uh, Mr. Carney to speak to the uh, time frame associated with that, but also um, emphasize the importance of having a 2019 fee in effect, no matter what that is. Um, the point that you're making about a graduated and, and tiered and stepped option, um, if that winds up being what people are interested in doing for the future, that we don't, we don't need to sit on this waiting okay. to come up with that because we need a 2019 fee. I just want to emphasize the sort of urgency of that. Okay. Um, but go ahead, Jim. So I'm Jim Kearney. I'm from the member of the Fort Williams Park Committee and worked on this subcommittee on commercial price. We presented a number of different scenarios. In front of you um, and included in the package tonight, um, we have what was originally recommended by the Park Committee. Then we had what was approved by the Town Council 
my understanding is tonight's discussion was only about motor coach fees, period. Um, and then what I included, or what Matt and I included rather in this package was two alternates, um, one which instead of 75 jumped into 100 and another for 125. In each of those cases, we recognize the need to get that fee up and you'll see in the, in the bottom line there that there's a structured approach over the next three years to get that to $150. We also, recommend, we, we also recognize that we had originally started this work for the 2018 season. We missed that opportunity. It is very important to get these fees out in front of the operators now so that we, we need to get it publicized. We need to get our signage correct. But there are different options that you can look at here. The other thing, just from, from a correction perspective, we've been looking at that 1,000 bus count from the year 2017. So I know there's been a couple numbers, 700, didn't, didn't recognize 1,000. This is all based on 1,000 buses, as was the case in 2019. So we just want to make sure we, we're all working with the same set of numbers. Any questions about that? No, thank you for the clarification, Jim, and again, for the continued work of the committee and subcommittee on this. Other discussion? Councilor Straw. Uh, so I, I'd note that, um, so I'm a small business owner and I make, I've made, I've made a number of really, really bad financial decisions. Um, and I've <laughs> lost my shirt at times with some of those and when it happens, it sucks. Um, but these fees were not etched in stone. They just weren't. Uh, you knew that they were subject to change and it, it's like uh, heating oil. If you have a rental property and you have a tenant and if you're paying for the heat and you don't have a contract for heating oil, the heating oil price goes up you may be losing money and it's just a cost of doing business. It is what it is and that's what the situation is here. I, I mean, I feel bad for you as a human being that you may lose money for a single season, but for the last few seasons, we have a town, we as a town have been subsidizing you. We have not been making enough money to cover our costs and you weren't coming to us and offering to pay more. In fact, last time we tried to raise the fees, we had pushback and they got lowered again. So I have not heard any town residents who are not connected to the bus in the, uh, the, the trolley services come before us and say, these fees are they're too high, we need to lower them. The only people I've heard come in here are people who have a vested financial interest from a business perspective. So now one could argue, well, if we have a diminution in buses visiting the park, we may lose out on revenue at uh, the gift shop. We don't know that for a fact. No one has done that study. When we have a financial director come in, they may be able to help us figure that out. But as it stands right now, I'm willing to bet that we actually won't see that much of a drop off at the gift shop. I'm willing to bet we won't see a drop off in bus uh, traffic. And frankly, one of the town councilors at the workshop, I think it was uh, Councilor Devereaux or Councilor Garvin, um, made the astute observation that we have long as a town council, as the Fort Williams Park Commission said, we need to figure out what we're doing with this park. We gotta make a decision. And by not making a decision, the decision is being made for us. And that's what much of tonight's agenda seems to be dealing with. It's we are being forced down this avenue of this is a tourist attraction without us making a conscious decision that that's the direction we wanna go. As we continue to keep these fees low, we're basically going down that route of this is a tourist attraction rather than a town park. So I think we should go for the higher fees uh, or the fees as we've agreed to. I think they should actually be higher. Um, I agree um, with, uh, I, I apologize, Jerry, I don't remember your last name, uh, but I, I love the fact that you come to our meetings with the financial uh, view on these things. Uh, I agree with much of what uh, Jerry and his wife uh, said with respect to the fact that the fees, if anything, should be higher. I think we've been subsidizing these bus companies for a number of years. I think we've been losing money as a town. If you look at the wear and tear on the roads, when you look at the costs of the porta potties, when you look at the cost of the employees, when you look at the cost of the wear and tear on the parking lot, and if anything, I'm ready to vote the fees higher. So if we continue to focus on these fees, I'm gonna start proposing 400, I'm gonna start proposing 500. 150 is a good deal, you should take it. That's it. Other comments, discussion? Um, Councilor Gabrielson? Yeah, I would just generally say, you know, I. I generally think that the, the fees as previously adopted by the council are reasonable and in line with where we should be. Um, I agree with the fact that uh, charging fees on the motor coaches is a fairly effective way for the town to 
get some revenue from the park without having to have a gate or a barrier to entry. I have more concerns, honestly, about impacts from pay and display parking and how that might affect locals' ability to use the park as a local park. But um, I'm, not, I'm not inclined to change the fee structures previously adopted. Other discussion? Um, I'm probably somewhere in the middle on this. Uh, you've long heard me say that I think that we need to extract every possible dollar from the existing fee structures that we have um, before we start introducing new fees like pay and display that Councilor Gabrielson just talked about. Um, and I think that we will only know what um, the sort of ceiling is on this you know, as we, as we continue to go up. My, my only reservation is I think that um, we were uh, uh, we, we were a little too abrupt in the, the leap and should have, from the beginning, come at this from a more um, graduated step approach that would more clearly signal to the business community that is most directly impacted by this um, what they could plan for and forecast for. I, I also agree that ultimately I want to see these go um, as high as the market will bear um, and as high as is reasonable for us to um, you know, make the most possible revenue from um, understanding, though, that, uh, and I, I think your analogy is a good one, Councilor Straw, about, um, you know, sudden variability and previously thought to be fixed costs. I get that. Um, but I think we could also, um, in a more gradual way, uh, achieve the ultimate um, point that we want to get to as far as these fees are concerned, but in a way that um, eases the the impact a little bit um, to those who are most um, affected by it. I agree with the point that was made by um, Ms. Amir that um, you know Norwegian, other other commercial entities, um, it's it's really no um, no impact to them. What was unknown to me before going into this was uh, the dynamic of the economics on this and the sort of middleman operator um, that exists and um, the very extended time frame by which they set their their contracts and their fixed costs and things like that so that any movement, um, you know, good or bad, um, would either, and in this case negatively, um, it's, they're not able to pass it along to the people like Norwegian who would feel it the least. Instead, they have to absorb that themselves. Um, so anyway, that's how I feel about it. I would rather us um, go to, um, you know, ultimately getting to 150, but maybe over the course of two years, uh, or getting higher than 150 over the course of three or four years, but being more prescriptive and more uh, telegraphed in what those changes are going to be so that um, all the different stakeholders can, um, uh, can plan for that. Ultimately, if we were to get to 200, 250 a bus or whatever the per visitor you know, number is that's being discussed, um, that's fine, but we could, we could do so, and I think in a more cooperative way um, by doing it gradually. <laughs> Sounds like I'm in the minority on that, but that's my opinion on it. So if there's not any other comments or discussion, I'll call the question. The yep, so my motion was to revert to the recommended fee schedule for motor coaches of $75 per visit or $70 triggered on the volume discount uh, that was originally presented by the Fort Williams Park Committee and the uh, Commercial Fees Subcommittee. So if you're in favor of that, all those in favor of that? Opposed? The motion fails. So seeing as how we already have the fees uh, that are outlined here in place, there's no further action needed on that unless somebody is looking to make a motion for a different fee level besides $75. Councilor Jordan. Um, I believe strongly in uh, more of a planned approach because I agree with um, Chairman Garvin that 
uh, we did kind of do it very abruptly and we didn't think it out like we normally would have as a, um, as a business person. That how do you take and, and move this up? Because I think we are in somewhat of agreement that we want to move these fees up, but did we do it too abruptly? So I'm going to make a motion that uh, we uh, move the fee to um, $100 for the motor coaches. Motion from Councillor Jordan, seconded by Councillor Jordan. Is there discussion on the, is this would be in the uh, agenda attachment that um, Ms. Kearney referenced, the alternate at 100, so it's $100 per visit with a $90 um, volume discount. And you can see the revenue projections based on the visitor assumptions included in that. Discussion. Yep, Councillor Devereaux. What is our time frame on this? We have, okay, if we change it to 100 or 150, do we have a set date for this? Uh, what, what is our time frame? Is it through 2019 or is it through November 1st of 2019? What, what is our time frame? Jim or Kathy, do you want to answer that? Yeah, so we need to do that this calendar year and based on the feedback we've had to recommend or the increase over the course of the next several years. Councilor Gaberson. What's the time frame that we should be thinking about getting a recommendation from the committee for proposed rate fees that would apply in the 2020 season so that operators have the time to accommodate their uh, budget work on that? Right away, it was our So we should expect to see an item next month. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I mean, I, that's not a I'm, that's I'm not a huge deal for us. We work on that but... very quickly. Remember, the, this came up in April of last year, so we're with that far behind already. So we're, we're kind of playing catch up to get these rates established for the 2019 season at Fort Clinton's Park. I think the question that's being asked, though, is also when do buses start coming, and when do they? What sort of how long is the season through? Buses start coming in the May June time frame, and they they start picking up obviously July and August, and then September and October is when we get crushed with uh, buses, buses primarily from uh, the the, uh, the ships. Lines. Yeah, the but if a bus showed if a bus showed up tomorrow, are they paying one hundred and fifty dollars? If, if a bus showed up tomorrow, they're not paying $150 because there's no one collecting fees. Tomorrow. Right. So Starting May 1st. May 1st is the season. season yep. Yeah. Okay. Um, but we want to get the signage and the posting right. and messaging out. But and then so May 1st, 1st through October 31st? Is that? Yeah. And any bus that makes reservations, we can collect fees from them. A lot of the tour buses pay well in advance yep. based on volumes that they establish up to a right. year ahead of time. So we need to start working immediately on the 2020 fee schedule. Right, so that's what I'm getting to. So if if whatever action we take on this tonight that impacts 2019, mm -hmm. any action between now and May 1st of 2019 is still more than a year out from May 1 of 2020. Yeah. Gets to your point. Thank you. Councilor Straw. Uh, so I won't support 100, but I see perhaps a way we can split the baby, so to speak, in that oh, I will support 100. Uh, based on, it sounds like a six month um, schedule, We've, we keep talking about having one fee the entire season. I would be willing to support 100 if we did 100 for the first three months and then 150 for the second three months. In other words, so long as we capture the end of the season at 150, I'll support 100 for the first three months. Other discussion? Councilor Jordan? Yeah, I was, was going to say, this sounds like a, a lot more notice and paperwork. And I mean, I, I'm comfortable supporting $100, and we're pretty much saying right now, plan on it going up. like. We're we're going to put it up again, right? Like right. that's then then they're they're not taking as big of a hit. You know, you're you're trying to hear what they're saying and apply it as opposed to well, we're gonna you know do a little bit and then 
knock it back up again. It's really, we might as well just give them as much, this is as much fair warning as you can possibly have. Because if you didn't get the hints of what we're talking about, it's going up again. Like, mm -hmm. if, if, it, if we can pass what it's at now. <laughs> I mean, it's already gone up, but we're going to try and bring it down and then put it up again for you next year. Other discussion? Councillor Deborah. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So you're saying it's the calendar year, basically. So once we set the fees, they're not retroactive to January 1st of 2019? We're not collecting. There, there are no motor coaches coming in the park now. We're not collecting. There's no one there to collect fees. I've seen coaches I'm, I'm, come by. Am I missing? Okay, yeah. so once you start collecting, and I, I've seen some coaches going by, so. I don't know where they're heading. And, um. <laughs> so it's, it's, a, it's complicated how we reach mo most of the motor coaches that come in pay well in advance or on a schedule for how many buses they're going to be bringing into the park based on cruise ship traffic and assignments that have already been people that have signed up for tours. So we get paid a couple times per year by these big operators. Then there are kind of the lead peeper buses and the onesies that show up and when there are rangers in the park and when we have staff to collect from them, we either collect from them there or they, they may have called and paid, and paid in advance or made a reservation. But we don't know every tour bus that's coming from the Casco Bay Bridge and stop in the park. We catch as many as we can. In the summer, we, I think we get in that, you know, I think we figure we hit 95% of the buses are or, or more or, or pain. Okay. So it's, so without the staff, we just can't do it. Go ahead, uh, Councilor Devereaux, if I may. Uh, at this point of the year, it's not really exactly cost effective for us to, to staff the park full time to, to collect fees just because yeah, you might have the unscheduled uh, visit that might happen to be coming through Southern Maine and they, they might take a dip through Cape Elizabeth uh, for a drive through the park and then they're out. But uh, we do, looking at the schedules uh, of different operators and seeing how, because they, they want to make sure that we know and working with our community services staff to know the times that they do so we can monitor and maintain a, a decent flow and plan for, for their arrival. So the bulk, yeah, from May 1st to November 1st is really the lion's share when we do, and then you will have the, the you know, the others, once we start the season, uh, we'll try to capture them, you know, when the, you know, when the weather allows and we start having staffing there, but really May 1st is, is kind of when we, we kind of swing into action with greeters and all the different staff down there. And uh, you okay. yeah, may get a couple in the shoulder season, but they're, they are robust folks. <laughs> okay. That's helpful. So, I, yep. I, I'm, I'm willing to support um, re having the fees revert to the $100 for this season um, schedule. What I would like to see um, from the committee at, at whatever time frame works for the Fort Williams Park Committee is um, my sense is that the fee structure really should have a basis in what the town's costs are associated with the use. Um, and my sense is that even at the $150 a motor coach level, we're well within the margin of what the costs are to the town from that use. But I'd like to get a better sense of how the committee understands those costs um, so that we can understand what that target that we're aiming for is. Um, my sense is it's gonna be north of 150. <laughs> um, and, but I think that will also help us um, forecast for the operators where we're hoping to go beyond 150 and, and give us a, a number that's grounded in something, uh, <coughs> a common understanding of, of what um, we need to be recouping from this use. From the commercial traffic. Yes. All commercial traffic. Yeah. That makes sense. I have a question too. Um, there's been a couple of references to per visitor, um, you know, revenue per visitor coming from these commercial vehicles and specifically the coaches. I, I wanna make sure that we're clear. Um, the committee did not, I don't think, look at a model that literally charged per visitor. I think the per visitor references I'm hearing here are on a presumed full capacity, you know, 
70 person, 65 person bus, right? Or, that or is correct. So we, we held uh, a number of discussions open to the public and had operators and citizens of the Cape um, attend. There was no notion of per visitor, it was all capacity based. We did introduce a new capacity range this year so we tried to delineate between cabs, limos, minibuses, trolleys, and motor coaches so that there was more parity within the system, but also try to keep the model as simple as possible. There was no specific per visitor charge. And can you maybe articulate a little bit further on why, I mean, you just, I think, began to introduce the idea, but why it would be very difficult, and Matt could speak to this too, I'm sure, about trying to operationally undertake a per visitor model? A literal per visitor model? We simply don't have the resources within the park to ever manage looking at how many visitors came on which trolley, which, which bus inside, which limousine that shows up for a wedding picture. I mean, it's, there's people coming and going all the time, very, very limited resources. We have to establish the schedule and then drive the operators to that schedule. Matt, do you want to add to that? 100%, that's the accurate answer. Just to, to have the manpower or the, or the personnel to go on and count out, you know, to do an individual head count per bus would be, uh, it just wouldn't be very cost effective for us. At the, at the National Park, you know, up at uh, Mount Desert Island, uh, Acadia, it's a whole different operation where they, you know, much more controlled environment as far as entrance and, and, and the product that they're trying to do, whereas we have, you know, two greeters on during the day and perhaps a park coordinator to try to get them to do that. They, I, I just think the model that they have is probably the most efficient uh, recommendation that you have. And, you know, if you break, you can break it down to say, if it's $100 right now, you're looking at, you know, they're looking at roughly 40 to 50, but you could say, uh, or passengers on a, on a bus, so you're looking at roughly $2 a head for a max on a bus. Now, if they, if they have 30 people on there, the rate is still, you know, would still be $100. So it, you know, how they want to break that down is one thing, but if we looked at that, that way it's non-discriminatory, if you will. It's, uh, you can have any color you like as long as it's white type of thing. Uh, uh, you, that's what the fee is, so um, that's the easiest way to manage it. And uh, at the end of the year, when, when we do settle up, we'll find that, you know, you probably, it would balance out in the long run. Chris, did you have another comment? Or? Uh, again, if... That I would, I, I'm going to vote no on the motion as it currently stands, but if it was modified, I think the tour operators should be forced to bear the burden of their decision to go ahead and lock in long-term contracts when they didn't know what the costs were. They did not know for certain what the costs were. They chose to lock it in. It's as if I lock in rent for a tenant. Uh, when I know my costs are going to fluctuate, and if they go up, I lose. If they go down, I win, and that's the situation they're in. Uh, so I won't support the 100, but again, I would be willing to split the baby, so to speak, uh, 150 for the last two months of the year, uh, 100 for the, the last two being the last two of the season, so um, or three, August, September, October, and the first three being 100. That's what I would support. Any other comments, discussion? Okay, the motion on the floor is to um, revise the currently approved and adopted fee schedule for motor coaches from the 150 per motor coach that we approved late last year down to the alternate at $100 option that was provided by the Fort Williams Park Committee, so $100 per visit with a $90 um, uh, volume discount. All those in favor of that motion? Opposed? That passes four to two. Thank you very much. Next up, more Fort Williams discussion. Item number 46-2019, pay and display parking at Fort Williams Park. Is there anybody from the public that wishes to speak on this item? Seeing none, um, uh, the manager has sent out um, requests for proposals. Uh, we have the material from one of those in front of us. I'm going to ask Matt to take us through uh, what you've received and, and update us on that, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yes, uh, the process as, uh, as laid out was uh, we sent out a request for proposal. Uh, 
posted it and get the, the wide area distribution on that. Uh, we had a pre-bid, a mandatory pre-bid that was held on December 20th uh, here at the town office. We had uh, four different entities uh, who attended the pre-bid, received bid packages, and uh, we had a final bid date or bid opening date of January 3rd at 2 p.m. in the same chamber uh, where we received one uh, one response to our RFP. And uh, it was brought by Unified Parking Partners out of Portland. And uh, to qualify, it, the, the RFP that we put out had uh, two options. One was to, as the council had decided to, or had, had uh, asked, was one to provide them the equipment and then uh, for the town to purchase outright. Uh, another one was to provide uh, the services, which would be the back house services, the management and the, and the enforcement capacity. And then the other uh, option would be to, uh, if an entity was, sorry about the, uh, the hammering, it's our, uh, it's our heat system, so. <laughs> uh, so the other option was to provide a full, a full turnkey package. People you got locked up on the, <laughs> it's the uh, very angry, very angry ghost. Uh, sorry about that. Um, so the second one was to provide a full comprehensive package, which would be to provide the equipment that the town would need to do the to do the parking. The second would be also to do the management and uh, all the back house operation as well as the enforcement. <laughs> and so that is the package that we received from Unified, and that's what we have here this evening. Uh, it's a you know, the, uh, we've had a couple different conversations with them leading up to leading up to tonight to qualify the bid. Uh, we did do a fairly extensive uh, bid package that we put out there, and uh, we've qualified it all the way through. I feel that the proposal that they brought forward to us meets every every attribute that was laid out in that. Uh, they've brought forward, as you might have seen, uh, they've really come to the table with a significant offering here to, to do it. I think it's, uh, and I think they would say, say as well, it's, it's conservative at this point, uh, but I would, uh, but I think it was very wisely put forward as conservative. Um, you're looking at roughly the town uh, with everything looking at it. Um, Sorry to interrupt. It's conservative in terms of the revenue projections. In, in terms of the revenue projections, because it's obviously safer leading into a package like this to come at it with a little bit of a, uh, I guess not 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 promising the sky and delivering uh, Middle Earth. Uh, so what we're looking at on this point is, you know, what the, page you want? Uh, on page six of the RFP, and when you when you get down to brass tacks, um, the 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 net amount that the town would be looking at based on the pro forma would be about $316,000. And that would be uh, more or less an 80-20 split of the net profit revenue uh, with a cap of their potential profitability at $100,000 for any individual, any individual year of the contract. Uh, but the numbers, you know, we've gone through this, I know Mr. Kearney and I have looked at this, I don't know how many times, uh, We've probably worn out the phone line between uh, between the two of us examining this, as well as speaking with the with the proposal uh, with Unified. And uh, you know, at this point in time, I mean, this was obviously the only response that we did receive. But I think it's it's not because uh, it was an opportunity. I think it, they really brought forward an excellent proposal to us for the town to consider uh, that that reflects everything that we were looking for uh, in our earlier projections as far as how we it may result in the long run uh, I guess we'll have to wait and see how the math works out but I think what they have brought forward is uh, is, a, is a really honest representation as to what we can start start with and then and then build from and and the town has no upfront costs uh, when it comes to this with them shouldering much of the burden when it comes to that I mean obviously the shouldering comes with an expense that you know the hope that they also receive profits from the organ from this uh, decision as well. But but I think it's a it's a good a, a very good faith a very strong good faith approach to trying to help us solve the question that we're trying to find and determine where we the town should be uh, or should anticipate for revenues. Just okay. Councilor Gaberson. Go ahead. Okay. Um, just because I'm interested in giving Jim a workout tonight, um, I'm <laughs> <laughs> I'm curious um, if the Fort Williams Park Committee has had a chance to look at this proposal or be involved in the design of the RFP. Um, and in particular, I have a number of questions. 
I, I can't say that I would vote in favor of the proposal as it's laid out tonight. Um, I have a number of concerns about the, the per hour rate, um, given that there's going to be areas that are free um, parking and also that there's already some pressure on on street parking in neighboring areas i think that jumping in with a four dollar per hour fee is likely to create some unintended consequences that i don't really want to go to so i want to um, i want to jump but, in just real yeah. quick the, the intention is not to vote tonight on okay. whether or not we're going to implement these fees that are outlined in this proposal um, my and the next item on the agenda relates to track traffic uh, regulations and parking ordinance and th uh, things like that. So what I would envision is um, we'll take this information that we have, probably go to one more workshop on it where we can okay. discuss um, you know some components to the um, not only the cost structure um, but other variables. Um, other considerations we've heard from um, you know several um, different stakeholder groups that have asked about you know potential exemptions things like that what I would then like to do is bring back at some point in the relative near future um, after that workshop something that we land on as a proposal to put forward schedule a public hearing on and then have that be the, the total packaged if we're going to go forward with this, this is what it looks like. These are the things that we've included, excluded for these reasons, and so on and so forth. Have people come, have a chance to weigh in on that, and then vote that up or down. Thank so we're not we're not planning to take any action on this tonight. So, okay, thank thank you for yep. that clarification. The other, um, I guess, the the question that I um, would like to ask for of of the park committee, I don't know that they have an answer for it tonight. Um, one of my concerns with this fully outsourced model is that we're going to have some employees on the ground managing the park, and the vendor will also have employees on the ground. And I, um, I'm, I have some concerns about public perception and confusion over enforcement issues and people feeling like the town is if there are percep if there's uh, a perception that the enforcement is overly stringent, that we, I want to make sure that we have the appropriate control to make sure that we're presenting a product that is consistent with the use of Fort Williams as a town park. Matt, can you address that? I can. I know uh, we spent a great deal of time discussing that that specific uh, amount, and I think. Uh, yeah, we explored it pretty pretty heavily as far as making sure you know a you know we both want to be successful. The town wants to be successful with the launch on this because it is such a paradigm shift, uh, and b it is yeah. it's tough to enforce, but there's a way to enforce, and we've had that discussion as far as being uh, in in a, in a in a friendly manner, in a professional manner, and in a uh, high customer service uh, like manner to to do that because uh, you know the heavy handed. Uh, approaches and wouldn't work for anybody. It would also it would short circuit anything that the town would want to accomplish. Because if it comes out and it would be a bad approach, then uh, then nobody's successful. And uh, so I think the vendor understands that. And I think probably the workshop approach would be an outstanding way because I, I know uh, uh, Unified would want to want to come and present, you know, and have that conversation as well to hear from the council. Uh, they, 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 you know, we had a number of conversations with them about it specifically as well. So, a lot of that, I think, yeah, probably in a workshop environment would be good, and then the council would have a, a great, a higher level of uh, confidence or, or comfort level as far as understanding uh, some of the particulars or the or the different tangential uh, thoughts that may may sprout from that uh, from that concept as well. Um, and then, as far as uh, uh, the model that they did have, it did take into take into account, and they, we can talk about this at the workshop as well. But uh, the free parking areas is, is built within to that model, as well as uh, we did have a number of discussions as far as uh, yeah, park toll avoidance, if you will, and how that might impact the neighborhood. And I know uh, Mr. Kearney and I when uh, we examined probably half a dozen plus RFPs from different towns and cities uh, that had gone uh, gone through the same exercise that, that we're currently going through and uh, used all those different elements in crafting the RFP that we did have uh, to come forward with. But yeah, the, the, I mean, a, a very major part of this is, you know, just 
yeah, the customer service side is, is a big part of it as well. But I think the workshop would probably be a great opportunity to, to explore uh, a heavy amount of it. Okay. Um, Councilor I don't want to belabor this, but I don't know if you, any of you who have parked in Portland lately. <laughs> and um, I, I want to stress what we're talking about here because um, there are a lot of challenges with people who encounter this type of parking lot in Portland now. And so I would want to see some really stringent customer service um, requirements because they may call them ambassadors, but I don't necessarily consider them ambassadors when I have encountered some of these employees. So when I saw this was the proposal, it was like, whoa. Um, so I think there's a long discussion we're going to have to have if this is what we're going to have representing Cape Elizabeth in Fort Williams. Mr. Chairman. Councilor Devereux. Um, first of all, I'm concerned that we only have one project proposal. Is there <coughs> There weren't, there's no other way to get another proposal in time, I'm guessing, so that this all could be implemented by May. When if, I, if I may, to, to, that, to that point, uh, we, we advertised it fully. We had four different vendors who came and then one chose to participate. So uh, it wasn't by a lack of effort and you know, folks do have to, I mean, we can't, can't force them to provide a proposal, but it's a business decision that others may have made who might might have been interested in one element, but they decided not to. I mm -hmm. uh, reached out to other national vendors as well who we had talked to before to see if they were interested in providing just the machines and and they just they were like nope we're 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 good at this point so and but there was not a lack of effort on our, our part to explore it, but we did uh, receive okay. the one RFP report response. My other question is when do we need to have this finalized? our steps finalized so that they can take action and have this put into place by May 1st or sometime in April? I don't think that we've been working under the specific objective of trying to have it in place by May 1st. I, I mean, I think that that's, if, if that happened, great. But I think, at least from my perspective, I've, I've wanted to make sure that we do this right and not do it fast. Um, so. Um, I don't see, we're not talking about the same kind of sort of contractual obligations and things like that. So if it starts May 1st, June 1st, July 1st, whatever, um, you know, it, all it is, it's lost revenue opportunity, but it's, there's, there's no, um, I, don't th I don't think we're under the same um, sort of stakeholder considerations that we are in the commercial side, but that's my opinion. Okay, well, if I can just reword oh. that. Yep. Have they said how long it will take um, for them to put this into action once we make a decision? Go ahead, Matt. Uh, they have a, about a two-week implementation period that they could they could install them with. Two weeks. As far as the actual devices, uh, all along the devices haven't been the biggest challenge. The biggest challenge, quite frankly, is the next item you have on the agenda, which is the ordinance, because once the ordinance gets adopted, then you've got. You know, you've got a public hearing for that, then the town council would have to adopt that, and then it's 30 days from that that it becomes law. So uh, that's, that's that's part of the two-part uh, approach. Uh, so buried in the RFP, they have an installation critical path, is what they call it. Um, in order to have everything installed on May 1st, according to their timeline, they'd want to order the meters on March 1st. Whether there's wiggle room in that, Presumably there is, maybe there isn't, um, but that's 60 days out. They're basically saying, we project we need 60 days before start date to get installed. Okay. Um, but again, a lot of that's the... Oh, you, you, One of the biggest challenges we'll have is signage and getting yeah. all yeah, the issues that we as a town can take care of, not so much the technology side. So. Yep, yep. It, and they have much of that worked in to their schedule assumptions as yeah. to how long it will take us and whatnot. Um, and I just wanted to thank Councillor Jordan for flagging something that it had in, uh, presumably, uh, and I'm gonna dance around exactly what you were oh, getting at. <laughs> I didn't catch it until you said it. Ah, I missed that. Um, we presumably will be able to say you cannot boot cars, right? They can't boot cars unless we give them the permission to boot cars, right? Okay. Presumably, unless, yes. unless they have the authority in our ordinance, they can't do it. Right. Yeah. All right. 
Other discussion? Okay. So what I'm going to recommend, we'll go to the next item on the agenda, um, and then what I'm going to recommend is that um, we combine items number 46 and 47 and take action to refer those to our March workshop. Um, but first we'll go to item number 47-2019, which is uh, recommended updates uh, Chapter 13 of the traffic regulations um, pursuant to Fort Williams Park. Is there anybody from the public that wishes to speak on this? Seeing none, in your packet, uh, there are um, uh, red line version of the current traffic regulations uh, with um, changes recommended relative to uh, uh, basically allowing for parking at Fort Williams uh, and for us to, uh, or allowing for us to make changes um, uh, that would allow for charging to park at Fort Williams. Um, the Ordinance Committee um, has reviewed this and voted unanimously um, to forward the recommendations on to us. So again, unless anybody has any specific points they want to make now or questions, um, Matt, if there's anything you wanted to hit on. No, My recommendation would be that somebody make a motion to refer items number 46 and 47 uh, combined to our March work, March workshop. So moved. Councilor Jordan, is there a second? I'll second. Councilor Devereaux, is there any discussion on that? Seeing none, all those in favor? That's unanimous, thank you. All right. Mr. Chairman, if I could yep. just make a quick comment. I want to thank the council for uh, for uh, taking this all in, and uh, the NO staff. I want to uh, identify and thank Maureen O'Mara for working on the ordinance uh, on this part, as well as uh, Jim Kearney and uh, Kathy Raptis and Kerry Curtis as well, uh, with helping us get to this point. Uh, because uh, you know we've had a lot of different eyes involved in this point, and uh, trying to bring this forward so the council can have a complete package so you can consider and make the best decision. And uh, I just want to uh, express my gratitude to them as well as yourselves for. I know you have a heavy lift ahead of you, and uh, and you're doing your hard work. So thank you for that. Thank you, Matt, and I echo um, the gratitude of the council uh, to all those people that you mentioned. I, I'll just again reiterate that what I'll be looking to do at our March workshop is have us come out of that hopefully with uh, a, a fully um, discussed and, and sort of vetted and, and consensus um, output that is this is what we recommend doing, this is the ordinance that supports that, bring that forward on the uh, uh, next agenda, and then uh, ultimately set a public hearing for discussion on that. Councilor Jordan. Could I make a request to get a hard copy of the proposal? Yes, ma'am. Please, thank you. Uh, I will, uh, I'll take care of that. I have one, if you want to follow me up after the meeting, I, I'll put one right in your hand. Uh, Mr. Chairman. Actually. Yes. Um, I, I just, I, I would, I'm curious before we move on to the next yep. agenda item, I'd like to make sure that we're making full use of our volunteers on the Fort Williams Park Committee prior to that March discussion, and I'm curious if there's any specific questions that we might like to have them address at a meeting. I don't know if they have a meeting prior to our March workshop, but any additional questions that the council would like to have answered or expertise that we'd like to seek from them prior to our discussion in March. That's fair. I'm, I'm happy to entertain that now, or if people want to send either myself or Matt their questions and comments, we can forward them on to the committee. Um, is the March workshop date set? It is. Um, Actually, we may have to. Well, you're looking at the RV tomorrow. Oh, okay. It's tomorrow. It's tomorrow. It's tomorrow. Yeah. It's tomorrow. Send them to you now. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Which is open at this point. Yeah. Um, Matt's reminding me that our existing Workshop dates in March are our typical um, department head budget review meetings, so we we will probably need to set an additional workshop um, to do this. Um, we have our regular meeting on the 11th. Um, dates that would be open would be the 4th. Uh, or potentially the 18th, I guess. Yeah, the sixth, the sixth as well. The fourth, the sixth, and the eighteenth are all possibilities. 
if anybody could look at their calendars and speak up with any conflicts. Four, if I can do. I prefer the fourth or the eighteenth, but any of those dates work. And the sixth? Sixth, I can do if I have to. Okay. Prefer I can do it. March fourth, sixth, eighteenth. Any of those three? Yep. All three will work for me. All three work. The six. Can't do the six. And you were a hard no on the 18th? No, I'm, I'm fine on any of them. 18th? Sorry. Who was out on the 18th? I'm sorry. I think the, everyone was in for the 18th. You were the fourth. I'm you fourth. Yeah. 18th? Yeah. We'll make sure we'll, we'll take care of it tomorrow. All right. Sorry to jam up that week up the then with three meetings, month. but it is what it is. So we're, we're looking at the 18th. 18th. Yep. Thank you. Okay. Um, I'll entertain a motion to set a workshop for the 18th, since it's not part of our schedule. So moved. Councilor Devereaux, is there a second? Second. Councilor Straw, any discussion? All those in favor? Unanimous, thank you. That All right. Seven workshop or? Yep. Seven. Well, I, I, I we can do it earlier if everybody works for everybody or not? Yeah. Do it earlier? Sure. If people want to go earlier? I can do whatever. Not? Sure. You good or not? Yeah, I don't have a schedule yet. Valerie might be a Six? Six. Yeah. Six. Six o'clock on the 18th. Six o'clock. Okay. All right. Are we all done on that, everybody? Thank you. Oh, okay. So the questions to the um, Park Commission. Uh, yes, sorry. One bit of Thank information you. I'd uh, like to, uh, A, just generally any feedback they have on it, and then B, um, with respect to the free or discounted parking, any suggestions they have, because it sounds like we have a number of various groups floating out there. To the extent you're aware of any, please flag them for us. Or if you have any suggestions on whether we do free versus discounted, versus, it sounds like they can do varying by days of the week, anything along those lines. Anything and everything you have to offer us, I want to hear it, so. Thank you, yeah. Maureen, did you have something you wanted to add? you through anything, but uh, I don't know if you've had a chance to look at the traffic regulations, but they are very generally drafted, and what they do is just really officially give the council authority to do what you want to do with parking in Fort Williams. Uh, if, if you, you may want to <coughs> consider tabling these to your April meeting, because otherwise if you bring them back to a council meeting, then you'll have to table it to a following meeting to hold the public hearing. If, if you if you leave these till March, okay. then you put them on the April council meeting and, we can and you table them to hold a public hearing in May. Oh, okay. okay. I'm just suggesting you could now make a motion to table them to the April meeting when you'll hold a public hearing. On the uh, number 47. Good suggestion. Okay. She's so smart. Thank you very much, Maureen. <laughs> You know your job, don't you? So, um, back to item, we're still on item 47, 2019. Is there a motion to table? on the table, right, to send it to... We already voted that. Oh, so yeah, that good. Yeah. We just need a new motion to table this to the April meeting, where we'll set up, where we'll have a public hearing on it. Correct. Just for the amendments. Yeah. Not right. Yeah. So on, on just on item 47, 47. yeah. Yep. Okay. Motion to table by Council Jordan. Is there a second? Second. All in favor? Okay. Thank you very much. Um, we done with Fort Williams for now? <laughs> <laughs> Next up is item number 48-2019, update on the reuse of the Spurwing School. Is there anybody from the public that wishes to speak on this right now? No? Okay. okay. Um, so, uh, as you all know, we've been having ongoing review and research uh, pursuant to the recommendation of the Spurwink Use School Reuse Committee. Matt's going to update us on uh, cost estimate and uh, uh, expense allocation uh, for furthering that work. 
thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll, I'll be, uh, be brief on this. Uh, I've been working with Joseph Shalad, a, a town resident as well as an architect, uh, to try to maintain or obtain the cost estimates to, and, uh, and a work plan to go forward with the Spurwing Schoolhouse. Uh, he, he, obviously, this is a, a multi-tiered approach that could, uh, that is part of the whole construction uh, planning approach, but to look at this end of it to make that rough determination. Um, I've talked to Joe about this, and he's come forward with the estimate not to exceed $12,000 to get to that point that we can then go out to find harder cost estimates to accomplish the renovation of the of the Sperling Schoolhouse. Uh, what my request is this evening is for authorization to uh, pull from the unassigned fund balance $12,000 to help us fund that and then move that forward so we can get in the planning process and and come back with a, a larger construction plan and estimates that the council can, may then can consider as we go forward. Thank you, Matt. Um, do you have a ballpark on the time uh, that he needs to complete that work? I think it, it would take approximately two months. Okay. That's what, what we think. Is there a motion to uh, authorize um, the expenditure of $12,000 from the undesignated fund balance for the renovation uh, uh, study and estimates as outlined? by the manager. Second. Council Gabrielson, is there a second? Council Jordan, any discussion? Council Straw? Um, did we send this out to RFP at all? Just the uh, the architectural services? Uh, so no. I have not. Um, so I feel a little queasy. Um, I'm, he may be the greatest architect on earth. Um, this may be an incredible deal. Um, but given the fact that he is the vice chair of the planning board, um, it gives me um, not sending it to RFP. I'd rather send it to RFP and have him bid and have it be way lower than anyone else. And then we go, oh, that's great, then we move forward. Especially if the actual project itself ends up having to go in front of the planning board. Um, so it, it gives me pause for that reason. If I, may. Yep. I have had that discussion specifically with him, and he, he obviously he said, you know, anything that would have to happen, he obviously have to recuse himself from any type of discussion that would happen, that would that would take place. Um, from my end of it, I was looking at it from just trying to to get the work because you know, it's been such a oh, long right, time, and yeah. the fact that he was right here and he was available, and uh, he's an architect of high, high response, but uh, and to get. The product that we're looking at now compared to what others may want to, as, as you know, taking part in looking at the school projects that we've been looking at, yep. they've been looking at, you know, larger s the scope of scale. I mean, I, th I think ultimately uh, looking at the project, it'd probably be up to, up to about a $60,000 project for him as a professional to do, you know, from point A to, to Z. But uh, to try to get this estimate from folks on a, at, at this level is kind of a unique ask, and that's kind of why uh, we've, been, we've been working with him, and he's been very generous with his time at this, at this point. And, uh, the thought had crossed my mind, but at the same time, uh, we are trying to get, get it done, so I, I chose expediency over, over the other. But, and, and the numbers seem you know, in, in track with what the market would bear as well from what an architectural services firm may, if not actually generous to the town, to the town side. Great, so uh, I'm totally oblivious as to what the costs are, but based on your experience, these seem reasonable, and if so, you've alleviated my concern. No, so. no thank you. Other comments, questions, discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor? Great, thank you. Uh, next item is number 49-2019, PAX Grant, Town Center Sidewalk Improvements. Is there anybody from the public that wishes to speak on this item? Good. My name is Nate Perry. I'm here on behalf of the Cables with Fishermen's Alliance. Um, <clears throat> uh, you guys are going to discuss goals, uh, and listed in those goals are uh, uh, two specific items that are really important to our group, um, and they have to do with access, specifically. Oh. Uh, among the recommendations of the Harbor Committee. Hey, Nate. Yep. I just wanted to, I think you jumped ahead to our next one. Did I? Yeah, we're, we're doing the 
sidewalk Sidewalks. improvements. So if you hold that thought for just a minute. I won't count that as your time against you. You still have the full three minutes. So anybody want to talk about sidewalks? No. Okay. Um, so uh, we authorized in, De uh, in December of 2016 a grant application to PACS for sidewalks in the town center segments 7 and 8. The application was selected for funding, which is now available. So we're being asked to consider accepting the grant to construct the town center sidewalk segments 7 and 8. Mm -hmm. Town planner Maureen O'Meara, is there anything you want to add to this? Or are you good? Okay. Uh, can I have a motion, please? Council Devereaux. Um, I make a motion that uh, Cape Elizabeth Town Council accept the $450,000 PACS grant for town center sidewalk improvements with the town's 25% match to be funded by the town center TIF account. Great. Is there a second? Okay. Councilor Jordan, any discussion? Mr. Chairman, if, yep. I, if I may, very briefly, uh, council goals discuss uh, us collaborating with other communities, and this is one of those uh, opportunities where we can state that collaborating with other communities has resulted in us helping receive this grant. Uh, we, this is part of a comprehensive package that was brought forward with the town of, uh, sorry, the city of South Portland and the city of Portland, and the three of us are, are combined recipients of a fairly large grant. Uh, that this is a this is a part of that. I think otherwise, if we hadn't collaborated with our, with our fellow communities, we would not have had the ability to receive this funds. And uh, also thanks to Maureen O'Meara and to Bob Malley for their work on getting this project forward. Uh, this is for 2021. Uh, that's the only thing, but, but we did, you know, the T had been crossed, but this is basically the I being dotted uh, this evening, and that's why we brought this forward. Uh, so thank, thank you for that. Okay, any other discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor of the motion? It's unanimous, thank you. Next up is item number 50-2019, Town Council Goals. Nate, would you like to pick up where you left off? <laughs> um, again, Nate Perry on behalf of the Cables with Fisherman's Alliance. Uh, we're very happy to see in your uh, goals that you uh, brought up in the previous workshops, uh, you're gonna be looking at implementing uh, recommendations from the Harbor Committee. Uh, many of those recommendations you'll see again whenever you get to in the next several months uh, in the comprehensive plan as well, I believe in the marine resource chapter. Um, specifically, uh, two items among the recommendations that are pretty important to us are the two easements that might be looked at. Uh, one is an access repair uh, onto Crescent Beach, which was a traditional commercial launch. Um, and the other is uh, securing an easement for our existing commercial launch. Right now there's nothing in writing. Um, so uh, specifically, I guess, we'd like to ask that the council, uh, going forward with its processes here, and, and I'm not sure how you guys go about implementing goals and what happens and at what meeting you do what, but. Uh, we'd like to ask that you allow yourself the flexibility if indeed, I know uh, one of the items refers to, in the goals refers to a uh, sort of a uh, coastal plan and that could be a whole undertaking. And uh, that may be really important um, and the recommendations from the Harbor Committee and the easements may need to be discussed as part of that. That may, that may be how it has to be. But we, uh, I guess, uh, I would like to see the council leave itself the flexibility to sort of act on these issues that it's already been discussing uh, to some degree since 2014-15. Uh, 2016 is when the Harbor Committee was established. So these aren't new topics. Um, and, uh, uh, and also I would like to uh, make myself available if I realize there's some new people on the council since uh, this process has been playing out and I don't know how that works in terms of uh, process where like uh, what's the difference between um, there needing to be like public notice or something but if ever uh, any councilors wanted to meet myself or any of the alliance members down at the easement and take a look at it I know it's kind of um, hard to picture sometimes. Uh, there are maps in, in the comp, uh, comp plan and in the Harbor Committee plan that are 
pretty specific, but um, maybe just meeting with constituents would be another way to do it and um, take a walk and you can see what we're talking about and tell you more about it um, when we don't have just three minutes after a, a super loaded agenda. So anyway, thank you. Thank you. Thanks for your patience sitting through all that other stuff too. Um, so there's nobody else uh, here to talk about any of that. Um, so back to the agenda item of the goals. Um, I'll just briefly actually answer kind of a question that came up through Mr. Perry's comments. Um, the goals, um, as I think most people know, are intended to be thematic and directional, um, not a specific work plan. Um, any of the things um, that Mr. Perry was just mentioning, either recommendations of the Harbors Committee or things that come out of the comp plan process, things like that, are all things that we can take action on, sort of separate and independent. Um, the goals are, you know, for us to kind of establish um, some of our to-dos for the year, some of the managers and the, um, uh, the department staff, um, as well as to provide guidance to the individual boards and committees that might be undertaking work uh, on behalf of the council um, in support of those goals. So anyway, just broadly speaking, I think um, there's probably sure to be action on some of the things you're talking about at some point during the year, is all I'd say on that. So. Um, so anyway, um, without any other further public comment, um, we had workshop sessions um, discussing our goals on both the 16th of January and then last week. Um, what you have included in the packet here is um, what Matt and I worked on to basically uh, clean up and um, sort of edit uh, the, uh, what was the consensus of the group uh, in our discussion. Um, for things that are no longer relevant from past years, we took those off. We added in some new things, specifically um, a full section on fiscal management. Um, there's, uh, you know, other things that are um, specific to some items around uh, adding public safety to the improved infrastructure facilities and services section, um, and uh, a few other highlights throughout around sustainability. So, um, without all being said, is there a motion to? adopt the goals that are included here. So Councilor Jordan, is there a second? Councilor Jordan, any discussion? Go ahead, Councilor Jordan. Um, number one, I, I think uh, both you and, and Matt did a great job kind of uh, summarizing all of our discussions and getting rid of some of the extraneous um, items. And I, I really appreciate the one that um, is about um, encouraging the town manager to continually evaluate optimal organization and structure. I think that is, uh, is right, on, right on the mark. Um, and um, the crafting of the coastal access plan, I think that is something that is important for us to do. So I think you, you've you captured uh, many of the items that we need to be, uh, be focusing on. So thank you very much. You're welcome. Other discussion? Okay, seeing none, all those in favor? Great, thank you very much. Uh, next item is number 51-2019. Uh, is there anybody from the public that wishes to speak on this item? Assuming no. Um, so this is uh, the item we discussed at our workshop last week about uh, appointment of a um, counselor to the Regional Voice Committee for the Greater Portland Council on Governments. Um, that person is recommended to be me. Uh, so is there a motion? So Go ahead. Go ahead. I was yawning, so you go ahead. <laughs> Councilor Devereaux. <laughs> I, I make a motion that Cape Elizabeth Town Council appoint Chairman Jamie Garvin to serve on the Regional Voice Committee for GP COG, Greater Portland Council of Governments. Um, Chairman Garvin will be submitted to uh, the GP COG Executive Committee for confirmation. Thank you very much. Second. Seconded by Councilor Straw. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor? It's unanimous, thank you very much. Um, their executive committee meeting is Wednesday too, so. Um, next item is number 52-2019. Uh, seeing nobody here from the public wishing to speak on that. Um, we're also looking to appoint a uh, alternate member for the Maine Municipal Association. Councilor Randall is the current delegate for 2019. 
Uh, I'm looking for a motion to appoint Councillor Penny Jordan uh, as the alternate Maine Municipal Association delegate. And further, that the town manager be considered as uh, an alternate to the alternate. <laughs> is there a motion? So moved. Councilor Strauss, is there a second? Second. Councilor Gabrielson, any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor? That's unanimous. <coughs> Lastly, um, I'm going to look for a motion to enter into executive session as noted here in the agenda for us to uh, discuss the annual evaluation of the town manager. Seeing the hour, I just will let you know that this will be a brief discussion. I'm not intending for us to be here for a long time, but we do need to go into executive session for the discussion. So, Councilor Straw. Uh, I move that the Cape Elizabeth Town Council enter into executive session with con in conformance with one MRS Section 405, subsection 6A, to begin the annual evaluation of the town manager. Is there a second? Second that. Council Jordan, all those in favor? Great. Thank you very much. We will convene an executive session in the other room. You know what, you know what yep.